I did not make this fanfic, support the author in the link below. What doesn't kill me by the silver or Chapter 1. Nezu. Happily sipping his tea, Nezu gazed out at the multitude of screens that showed the various battle sites for the heroics entrance exam, pleased at the level of seriousness and readiness each site showed. Until he got to site B where he saw one of his applicants scowling at another nervous-looking boy, holding the green-haired potential shoulder harshly, while most of the other applicants laughed and jeered at the site. The audio carrying comments of not needing to worry about that one and one less bit of competition to worry about, some even mentioning another applicant had told them the green-haired boy's quirk. Such uncouth behavior. Nezu scowled at the blatant bullying from those aiming to enter the heroics profession, the other teachers taking note of the scene as well. Not concerned about not watching other screens as they'd be watching the footage from every side over the week to decide who deserved how many rescue points. Riding off another applicant like that, so illogical. Azawa sighed, taking a long pull from one of his numerous juice pouches, all of them watching as the green-haired boy finally had enough for frustration and anger to override his nervousness. Shoving off the boy holding his shoulder as he forced his way to the front of the group to wait for the gates to open. The others saw him as so little of a threat none of them tried protesting or stopping him. A moment present Mick gave the order to begin Nezu watched the boy take off, his body rippling and darkening as he grew, his shirt shredding apart, and pants stretching as he grew another couple of feet. His skin becoming a dark grey with what looked like the hints of forming spikes in various points. They weren't concerned after learning his quirk was that lad King gaped, stunned at the apparent overconfidence of the applicants who Nezu noticed, were just as stunned at the change. Hmm. Nezu hummed to himself as he started pulling up files, easily finding those sent to site B as Uku Midoriya, quirk. Adaptation. His quirk is a transformation quirk that Nezu trailed off, his blood running cold at the description. Nezu, what's wrong? All Might asked, coughing worriedly at Nezu's silence. His quirk involves him adapting to what he's endured before. One portion of it is a passive healing factor that reportedly lets him recover from near anything within 24 hours, so long as he's still alive. Nezu started with the less concerning portion first. Not the best for immediate hero work if it takes 24 hours, but it would make recovery much easier. Recovery girl used as the other teachers listened in, likely intrigued by Nezu's reaction. And his form evolves as he endures as I've said. Enough blunt force used against him cause his transformed state to have stronger skin. Burns result in him resisting fire. Blinding lights and deafening sounds become less effective each time. Nezu closed the folder, eyes locked on the screen as he saw this applicant tank a missile from one of the one-pointers, grasping the robot as he ripped it apart. So, the longer a fight goes on the better he'll be able to handle it. Midnight asked, considering the applications of such a power. No, it's not per fight. It's permanent. Nezu scowled, and according to his file, he only fully learned this ten months ago when a villain attacked him, and he transformed in a panic. That was the first time he used his quirk since it came in back when he was four. Initially it just made his skin slightly grey as he hadn't had time to develop any resistances with it yet. But in between it manifesting, and that incident ten months ago his transformed state has acquired a great deal of resistance to bright lights, loud noises, blunt force trauma, pain resistance, fire resistance, and can handle being dropped from great heights. Everyone in the room knew how many people could be about quirks, especially if they were seen as weak, so that many resistances would imply the kid was either reckless and went out of his way to develop them. Something they knew wasn't the case given he reportedly didn't know about that fact until recently, or he was bullied by others using their quirks on him. Fuck, if he went villain. Power loader shuddered as they saw Izuku get between an attack from some three-pointers and other applicants, tossing those applicants up and over towards the robots to deal with them while he covered an injured student. Nezu couldn't hide the sheer relief that the child wasn't jaded enough for that yet. Didn't that crowd say another applicant told them about his quirk? Ectoplasm leaned forward, pulling up the records as well, the only other student from Midoriya school is one Katsuki Bakugo in side A. A nod at the screen showed an aggressive-looking teenager blowing up robots with a manic grin. They aren't going in the same class should they both pass. Nezu stated firmly, eyes showing he'd broke no argument, not that his staff would. This was a serious matter that they'd have to look into, whether the boys passed or not. Both of them had dangerous quirks that would make for terrifying villains, and if even half of what he feared was true, then both needed to be carefully guided to avoid such a fate. Izuku. Snarling, Izuku tore apart another one-pointer, not caring about the feeling of metal digging into his palms, the lacerations that slowly let out blood from his cut palms. They'd be fine in a few hours anyway, so it wasn't like it really mattered. His old friend Kakin's explosions hurt more anyway. Feeling an explosion hit his back, Izuku grit his teeth and turned to the source. Throwing the scrap remnants of the one-pointer in his hands at the three-pointer that had attacked him from behind. 
His body ached everywhere, but he ignored that, looking for more robots to smash. He had to get into UA, had to prove everyone wrong. Before he could find another robot though, he felt the ground around him shaking, loose stones from damaged buildings falling to the ground as everyone began to freak out, looking around in a blind panic before seeing the rising metal monstrosity. That's the zero pointer. Another applicant screamed in fear, the darkening stain on the front of the coward's pants, showing just what he was currently thinking, as he ran away like a chicken without its head. That coward was the breaking point as every other applicant Izuku could see started doing the same, although not all copied his fashion trend of pissed pants. H help. A weak voice came from the path of the zero pointer, Izuku's protected hearing picking it up, while others likely were having a harder time after the explosive appearance of the giant robot. Looking he saw a familiar head of brown hair and he moved. Letting out a primal roar, the culmination of all the rage and resentment that he'd been dealing with for years, that had built up over years of dealing with the bastards in his life, of everyone looking down at him, finally pushing him past his nerves. The scream carried as he saw the brunette girl who'd helped him at the entrance to the school earlier look up, spotting him charging, his steps loud as they pounded against the ground. Getting to her he saw a large slab of concrete pining her down, her ankle not looking in the best shape. Hold still. Izuku grunted, picking up a massive slab to let her crawl out from underneath it. He saw her try to get up only to scream and drop, clutching what had to be a broken ankle. Tossing aside the rubble, Izuku picked her up and started running, the one pointer focusing on them as he ran with her, the other applicants all either just watching or still running to save their own hides. Hearing the bot coming closer and seeing some of the applicants just watching close by, Izuku grunted as he threw the brunette girl towards them, the idiots panicking and working to stay up as they caught her. Just in time for Izuku to get backhanded by the robot into a wall, his legs snapping from the impact as he let out a yell of pain and rage, the robot slowing to a halt as present make called for the end of the exam. Ignoring the stares and whispers from the other applicants that were just standing there and staring at him with his leg bent in an obviously unhealthy way, Izuku pried himself from the wall. Using a ripped out light post as a crutch as he made his way towards the approaching woman in a nurse's outfit. Wait why did she look irritated at him coming to see her, and why did that make him nervous? Chapter 2. Man. With the pairing there has been some trimming to the list. Momo and Najira are still options, the class B girl is narrowed down to Riaiko Yanagi. And I'm removing Melissa and the pro-heroine options, as I'm just not feeling Melissa for this Izuku, and the pro-heroine one does feel like it should be its own story if anything. Chapter 2. Bakugo. Hey said in his near ever permanent sneer, Bakugo continued his exercise in his room, using the pull-up bar he'd installed to keep working up a nice sweat. As he pushed himself, he replayed the entrance exam in his head, relishing the memory of crushing those stupid robots and showing you a just what the next number one looked like. His musings were interrupted by the shouting of the old Hagawai. Katsuki. A letter from UA came for you. About damn time. Katsuki felt a feral grin on his face as he dropped down, throwing the door open to go get his letter, I wanna see just how high they scored me for this thing. Language you little brat. His mother scolded, slapping him upside the head as he snatched his letter from her, the old man sighing in exasperation as he watched Katsuki and his mom argue. I'll talk however the hell I want. He shouted back even as he ripped open the envelope to reveal a tiny disc, what the fuck. I thought it was supposed to be a letter. It's a recording disc. His father spoke up, taking it from Katsuki's hand to activate, a small screen appearing with a countdown, as Katsuki waited for whoever was gonna be on the damn thing. Hello there young Bakugo. The moment the countdown ended the screen was filled with a cheerful face of all might, I'm guessing you're pretty confused right now. You bet your damn ass I am. He yelled at the recording, ignoring his father's remark that the recording can't hear him, and his mother once again scolded him for cussing. Well, that's a surprise I've been keeping for you and all your new classmates. As of this year, I am the newest faculty member at UA Academy. All Might declared proudly, sending a thumbs up at the screen. Fuck yeah. Katsuki yelled happily, his hands crackling with tiny explosions he couldn't contain in his excitement. Now, onto your scores. You did remarkably well in the written test, scoring at 94%, putting you in the top 5 of written exams for those taking the entrance test. All Might announced as Katsuki smirked in smug satisfaction, managing to put aside any annoyance at his score not being perfect, at not being the highest, the practical was all that really mattered anyway. As for the combat test there were two factors for the scoring. The villain points you were made aware of, and rescue points. This is a hero school after all, and how could we call ourselves such if we don't reward students who act like heroes? Probably for those weak losers who can't make it as an actual combat hero. Katsuki smirked smugly as the top scores started appearing on a screen behind the number one hero. 
young Bakugo, while you failed to collect any rescue points your villain point total was the highest of the day with a total of 77, giving you the second highest score for the exam. All Might smiled as if he hadn't just given horrible news. Second. Second. Nobody was better than Katsuki Bakugo. As the man stepped aside to show the chart, he glanced at the top to see what dumb fuck he'd have to crush, and his blood went cold for a moment. Shocked when he saw the name Izuku Midoriya showing a total 58 villain points and 83 rescue points, a total score almost double what Katsuki had. That little fuck had to have cheated. There was no way in hell someone with a quirk as useless as turning grey could ever beat Katsuki at anything. Yikes, poor Midoriya. His father's words, and noticing that the recording had come to an end, snapped Katsuki from his thoughts as both he and his mother looked at the man in confusion. What are you talking about? Little Izuku got the highest score, why are you feeling sorry for him? Katsuki's mom asked, sending a stern glare his way when he growled angrily at the mention of their scores. Because of the boy's teachers. His dad pointed out with a shake of his head, the class lists having apparently been shown, while he focused on figuring out how Deku cheated Yue. Katsuki actually has a really good teacher for himself in Sekijiro, Kansas, or the Blood Hero. Vlad King since that man's quirk also revolves around weaponizing one of his bodily fluids, so he'd be the best to help Katsuki improve his own quirk usage. At least Yue. Was giving him a good teacher, Izuku on the other hand has one Shota Azawa as his teacher. Katsuki saw his father remove his glasses to rub tired eyes, I looked into the various teachers at the school to have an idea who would be training Katsuki, and found out about him. I couldn't find a hero name, so the man is either retired early or an underground hero, but he has a nasty reputation. Last year he expelled his entire class on orientation day, deciding he felt they didn't have any potential. This included half the recommendation students and six of the top 10 scoring students from the entrance exam, the number one spot among them. Izuku has his work cut out for him if he wants to even get past the first day. Hearing that, Katsuki smirked, his anger cooling. So, what if Deku cheated the test initially? Now that he knew what sort of person would be teaching the little shit, he knew the damn fake would be kicked out in no time. Maybe having a bit of hope built up only to be crushed at the peak would finally drive the message into his thick skull. Nezu. Thank you for coming here today. Nezu nodded to the always tired Yakimiro Mara, the public safety commission rep looking as exhausted as he always did. Well, you did have a serious situation. The man sighed, cracking his neck even as Nezu poured them both tea, Mara's hero escort declining, but really, did you have to get two watchlist students? And different lists at that. I didn't exactly choose for them to warrant the list, but I'm not going to risk things. Nezu informed him, eyes serious as he placed his paws together, the first is one Katsuki Bakugo. There isn't much evidence at the moment, but he does show an incredibly volatile temperament. With his quirk being as volatile and easy to abuse as it is, as well as other factors that imply he has abused his quirk in the past, I'm having him placed on a low-level watch list for now. He'd prefer having a more definitive answer, but with the boys' prior schools clearly covering up something given how sparse their records are it was the best he could do. Simple enough. Mara nodded, the man likely used to getting a dozen or so cases a year of a student with a big head and a dangerous quirk joining a hero school, and being watched to make sure their superiority complex didn't make them go rogue, and the other one. You said they were for a different list. Indeed, and his quirk is far more dangerous. The first boy is able to produce a nitroglycerin-like substance as his sweat that can be stored and even detonated at will. This child though, one Izuku Midoriya, has a transformation quirk called Adaptation that lets him heal from near anything within 24 hours and better adapt the next time he runs into a situation, evolving to handle it better. Judging by the boy's history I read in a report and what he was able to show at the exam, I believe that before his quirk was fully understood, other children who thought his quirk weak or useless would often use their quirks in bullying or torment of the boy. He's not jaded enough to go villain yet, but I'm worried if something pushes him over that edge. That's it. Mara's hero escort, Azawa's old school time rival and now pro hero Mr. Blaster, snorted in derision, that's what's got you so scared. Maybe you should retire if you're getting that chicken in your old age. Since Soji, I see you're as brash as always. Nezu narrowed his eyes, not appreciating his old pupil's comment, but since you are clearly in need of a lesson, allow me to educate you, just like old times. Hopefully you'll make a better grade this time around. This boy's quirk lets him adapt, so let's create a scenario where he went villain and was fighting you. You're both battling and it's a very tough fight, but, in the end, he manages to escape when he realizes he's not going to win. You both have taken some serious injuries, but you're both alive. A day or so later he shows up again, perfectly healed while you aren't at the top of your game anymore. More than that though, your explosions aren't doing as much damage to him as they were the last time. 
You might still win, but he'll just come back the next day, all healed up and even more resistant to whatever you could do. Resistance that does not go away. And it isn't just one resistance he has to select either, all his resistances are passive, so he doesn't have to worry about sneak attacks, so long as he's in his transformed state. And if he finds a partner with a warper teleportation quirk, then he could always have them stand at the back, ready to get him out if he would lose. Given enough time this boy could grow strong enough to dismantle All Might to the point it would be like watching a pro fight a quirkless child. That is what has me so worried. That is what I intend to do my best to avoid becoming a reality. But in case I fail I the commission and other heroes aware and ready. After his tirade and glare, the shaken pro hero backed down, wisely shutting up as Mera sighed in exhausted frustration, draining his tea in one gulp. You just have to give me more work, don't you Nezu? The man took the reports and documents as he got up, I'll have the commission ready, you just do what you can, so all that'll ever come of this is my grumbling about wasted time and lost opportunities to nap. Man. And next chapter we get the first day and the quirk assessment test, so stay tuned everybody. Chapter 3. Man. I recently found some people were confused on this, so I just want to make it clear that Izuku does not have one for all right now. I'm undecided if he'll get it at all. All Might wasn't the one to save him from the sludge villain in this, the one who did save him will be revealed later, and yes, I have already decided who that is. A and 2. At the moment for the pairing, I'm leaning towards Riaiko with Najire trailing behind as a close second. Not sure about Momo as well I have nothing against a pairing, and even enjoy fix of them shipped, it doesn't seem to fit this story to me. A and 3. And a lot of people got confused on this, so I want to clarify something. Nezu and the Hero Commission aren't treating Izuku like a time bomb, or trying to make sure he doesn't reach his full potential. They recognize the signs of potential history as an abuse victim that, when paired with his quirk, would make him a dangerous villain. The watch list is to make sure he gets the help he needs, and to make sure people don't prod him into becoming a villain while they help him get better. Chapter 3. Izuku. Drowning, Izuku glanced down at his schedule as he wandered the halls of UA, trying to find his homeroom in the massive complex. They couldn't have included a map. He grumbled to himself, his other hand using a grip training tool to exercise, having taken up training to distract himself from his nerves. You okay there? Hearing a voice he didn't recognize, Izuku looked up to see a girl with orange hair grinning at him, her uniform showing she was a first-year Hero Core student as well. I'm kinda lost. Izuku admitted sheepishly, I'm trying to find class 1A. Oh, me too. I'm Itsuka Kendo, nice to meet you. The now-named Orange T, who was also his classmate, offered her hand as he shook it. Izuku Midoriya. He returned with a nod as they set out to find their classroom. Wait, as in number one at the entrance exam Midoriya. Kendo's eyes widened in shock as they rounded a corner, a sign sticking out of the wall, thankfully saying 1A. Yeah, I was kinda surprised when I saw my ranking. Izuku admitted, having no idea about the whole rescue points thing. He thought he'd lost a lot of points whenever he moved to help out the other applicants who hadn't been assholes to him. I can get that. I know I wasn't expecting fifth place. Kendo nodded as they entered the class, Izuku noticing that while he was thankfully spared Bakugo, the blue-haired guy who kept calling him out at the exams was here. Good, you're all here. A voice came from the shadowed corner, its occupant having apparently gone unnoticed by the class as the other 18 members of class 1 had beaten himself and Kendo to the room jump startled. From the shadow came a man in all dark clothes, a long grey scarf around his neck and eyes that made Izuku feel nervous. My name is Shota Izawa, and I will be your homeroom teacher during your time here at UA. Well, so long as you're in the heroics course at any rate. Sir, what are you talking about? We are here so why would you expect us to not continue to be in this course? The blue-haired guy from the exam stood up, shouting and robotically chopping the air. I'm going to be blunt. Azawa pulled a juice pouch from somewhere and drained it, I have very high standards for myself and the hero profession. That means I'll be holding you to a high standard. If I feel you don't have the potential, that you're not giving it your all, that you're wasting my time, then I'll have you kicked out of this course and down to gen ed so fast your head will be spinning. And if you don't believe me then check class records, I had to expel all of one last year. Wait, you're telling me there's no class 2A? An energetic sounding pair of clothes that he assumed just contained an invisible girl shouted in shock. No, there is one. Azawa didn't seem phased at everyone's mental whiplash, students from other courses have the potential to be moved to the hero course, should they show both aptitude and desire. Meaning if I kick you out you have the chance to earn your way back, but even if you do make my cut a skilled enough student from one of the other courses can take that spot away if you're not careful. The man's aura was terrifying as Izuku saw one of his classmates, a boy with purple balls for hair, get reduced to frantic tears. 
Now, put these on. And as if the last conversation never happened, the man's death gaze was gone as he lazily dropped a large bag on his desk, inside you'll find gym uniforms with your name on them. Change and meet me in the fields outside within 10 minutes. But sir, what about orientation? The brunette girl he remembered saving from the zero pointer looked shocked. Orientation is a waste of time, now move it. You only have 9 minutes and 12 seconds left. Azawa. Lazily drinking another juice pouch, Shota waited for his students to get down here. He typically preferred to do his usual expulsion threat, it was only a scare if they impressed him, but Nezu had him explain things to the students first. Probably because of that watchlist kid Midoriya, something he didn't really blame Nezu on. That kid needed training and if Nezu's guess about his history of being abused was true, combined with the kid's hero obsession his file indicated. Then he'd likely go vigilante if expelled, which had more than once turned a good person into a villain. Whether it be from what they saw or how society treated them for their actions. Hearing the doors open, he noticed them coming down as a group. Some looked nervous, some looked confident, and others just plain apathetic. Good, you all made it in time. Azawa clicked his pen and readied his result recording gadget, during your entrance exams, you all got a small taste of using your quirks in a practical setting. The Ministry of Education insists that outside of schools for heroes like UA, that quirks not play a part in your daily lives. This is irrational and a hindrance. Midoriya, step forward. His gaze focused on the small greenie, the kid looking extremely nervous and not at all like the raging combatant he watched get first place in the exams. There are several standard fitness tests you would have done in middle school, ones where your quirks were forbidden. Pulling a softball out he tossed it to the kid Midoriya, you scored first in the practical. How far could you throw a softball back in middle school? D20 meters sir. The kid looked away, clearly uncomfortable at his score. Although whether that score was because of lack of confidence, due to him not having trained before, or fear of what his bullies would do Azawa wasn't sure. We'll do it again but with your quirk. Azawa pointed to the circle, you can do whatever you want so long as you don't leave that ring. Is this wimp really the guy who got first place? Mineta muttered to his classmates, particularly the female ones. Great, he just had to get the horny student. Every year had at least one applicant who thought being a hero was the fast and easy track to getting laid. What a loser. I bet he'll beat his scores. He saw Mineta eyeing the girls as he spoke, hoping they'd be impressed. Midori on the other hand showed his nervous expression turn into a scowl, perhaps something had happened before they got to the field, for that kind of a reaction to happen so easily. Understood sensei. Midoriya growled, his body growing and skin darkening as he transformed into his new state. Thankfully Yue had tracksuits for students with size-altering quirks, so he wasn't suddenly naked. The students who hadn't seen his quirk in action were all stunned and muttering up a storm, particularly a now terrified Mineta. With a yell, Midoriya reared back and threw the softball as hard as he could. 462 meters. As Awa read off the device that recorded the throw, showing it to the students, this is the difference between using your quirks and not, the level I intend to train you as heroes. As I mentioned before if I feel you aren't giving your all, if I feel you don't have the potential, then you're gone. And, as a nice little incentive, I'll add this. The person who comes in last place will spend the next week cleaning the classroom by themselves after school. But that's not fair. Mineta cried out, the diminutive boy likely already afraid he'd take last place. Life's not fair. Azawa glared at the now pale students, his eyes glowing and scarf billowing ominously, earthquakes, storms, war, villain attacks. These things all take lives, they kill innocent people, and they aren't fair. Your job as heroes is to do all you can do balance out the unfairness in the world, to help as many people as you can. If that's too much for you then just quit now and stop wasting my time. Midoriya, back in line. Kirishima, you're up next. One by one the students did their tests, doing everything they could to avoid coming in last. Eventually though, the scores were tallied Mineta, you've placed last so for the next week you're doing all the cleaning in the classroom by yourself. Eirozu, you placed first, so you don't have to do any cleaning for the week after Mineta's punishment ends. The students all nodded now, go change and collect the syllabuses that were left for you in your desks. You can spend the rest of the day exploring campus and learning the layout, if you have any questions I'll be in my office until 4. First though, Mineta, Midoriya, stay behind. Did you need something sensei? Midoriya approached him first, the boy not as angry as he was earlier, but thankfully not a stuttering mess. Mineta however was blubbering like a child. Yes. Firstly Mineta, I want to make it clear that if you don't shape up you won't last long in my class. If you're just here in the hopes of getting a girl to spread her legs, then you should quit now and find a new career path. The purple-haired boy blubbered, but Azawa didn't care as he sent the boy away, Midoriya waiting patiently. And me sir? 
Midori approved, his eyes showing his nerves were starting to manifest again. I noticed that you've put on a large amount of muscle compared to the picture in your file which is barely a year old. I wanted to know how you changed so drastically. Azawa didn't want to think his student would use steroids, but wanted to be sure. A few months ago, I got attacked by a sludge villain. Midoriya shuddered at the memory I used my quirk for the first time in years, which is how I learned it was more than just turning gray. That much he knew from the kid's file, but he didn't interrupt the hero who captured the villain took me to a quirk doctor to figure out what happened, and they had a specialist with an analysis quirk study mind to figure out what it actually did. When they found out the full details the hero who saved me pointed out how my passive healing factor would be amazing for training, as I could exercise hard and need next to no recovery periods. I spent the next several months cleaning Tacoba Municipal Beach Park, hauling the garbage to an actual dump to work various muscles. Good. Well with UA we have actual training facilities. Go get your syllabus which will have your full student ID and list what gym you can use. Azawa sent the boy off, silently thankful that Nezu had thought ahead and made sure Midoriya and Bakugo didn't have access to the same facilities. Watching the kid leave he made his way to the staff room, hopefully he'd get a chance to speak with Kansas about how the Bakugo kid was acting. Chapter 4. Azawa. Groaning, Azawa sunk into one of the chairs in the teacher's lounge, a steaming cup of coffee in hand, as he took in a deep breath to enjoy its end. Well, you certainly look tired. Midnight smirked at him as she and Mick walked over, Kansas already collapsed at their table. He's always tired. Mick snickered as the four of them sat together, anyway, how were your homeroom brats? Energetic. Azawa pinched the bridge of his nose plus I took a chance to check everyone's records, and I'm already dreading the headache that will be the next few years. What do you mean? Mick, who as far as Azawa knew had never bothered checking a student's record, tilted his head in confusion. We have a lot of watchlist kids this year. Even if they aren't problems themselves the PR lessons that they'll need will be a nightmare. Azawa grimaced as he took a deep swig of his coffee. What, is it more than the two Nezu focused on in the entrance exam? Midnight frowned, leaning forward as she dropped some of her playfulness to take the matter seriously. There are 14 watchlist students scattered throughout the various first-year courses. Azawa looked at them saw his colleagues' eyes bugged out, primarily in the two hero classes, but general education and support have one each as well. Alright, fill us in. Mick groaned, grumpily nibbling on a scone, we should probably know now. We know about the Midoriya and Bakugo boys so who's next? Both of my recommendation students are being watched. Azawa pulled out their files, having them ready so he and his co-workers could plan how to handle the various situations and extra lessons that would likely be necessary, first we have Momo Yarozu. Her quirk lets her create anything she understands the atomic makeup of by transforming her lipids. It's not a one-to-one -one sacrifice either since I saw her create an entire cannon, a functioning electric scooter, and even more during the assessment test, and still be able to move around. She's lower priority given that while well, she could destabilize the world economy, her family were already rich before she was born. There is concern about her using that to restore her family fortune should they lose it, being kidnapped by those who would abuse her quirk, and the threat of her being able to simply make an atomic bomb after eating at a buffet, should she ever go villain. Thanks, that's a thought I needed. Midnight grimaced. Thankfully, it seems her family already raised her to be aware of this, so she seems fully understanding of the consequences and will likely need the least help for PR lessons. Azawa gave some of the only good news he had with his list, next one is a different issue that I'll be bringing up with Hound Dog when I get the chance. Shoto Todoroki, son of Endeavor. Besides the scarring on his face from when his mother apparently had a psychotic break, there are concerns among many about the Todoroki family home life that nobody has been able to prove or disprove. Hence, the government is concerned and is watching Todoroki, although I have a feeling the Hero Commission is more worried about saving face if the number two was found of a crime than anything else. Suo therapy for the candy cane kid, got it. Mick was writing notes down, thankfully showing he could be serious when necessary. Thoru Hagaker, her quirk is a mutant type invisibility. There was concern growing up if she would use her quirk to steal or spy, so she was put on the watch list. Hers was thankfully simple and would hopefully not need much extra work. Next is Fumikage Tokoyami. He himself isn't an issue, however his quirk is not only fully sentient with its own thoughts and wants, but when surrounded by darkness, said quirk grows stronger and more violent. It was a concern if he ever lost control of Dark Shadow, so he was placed on watch. The last one in my class is the one I expect to be expelled in all honesty. Shoda, you know you shouldn't go into teaching your classes expecting to expel the little listeners. Mick scolded him exasperated. Minoru Mineta, as Awa wasn't phased by the scolding quirk pop-off, his hair is made of sticky balls that he can remove at will and place on surfaces where they will stick to whatever touches them for a few hours. 
he himself bounces off of these. I fail to see how that warrants a watchless spot. Kansas lifted his head from the table, still looking exhausted. He's also been written up at his old schools for inappropriate comments more than once, showed a disturbingly open amount of pride in his perversion, and according to some of his classmates who slipped me a report to not make a scene. Was trying to find or see about making a peep hole into the girl's changing room. His quirk is one a peeping Tom could easily abuse, and it looks like he's one of those students only trying to become a hero, so girls would have sex with him. Ugh. Midnight gave a disgusted scowl, I enjoy a good role in the hay, but at least I take my job seriously. I hate students that think this is just an easy way to hook up. The rest of the hero ones are in Khan's class. Azawa glanced over at the Blood King, I'm sure you can guess which ones. Akugo, Manama, Kamori, Shishida, Kawaro, and Kamakiri Wright. Kansas nodded, I checked into my class at least. We already know about Bakugo, but Monoma has shown to be somewhat unstable at times when his inferiority and superiority complexes act up making some concern for his mental state. Hamori can make mushrooms grow from her body including hallucinogenic ones, so the government was concerned on that front. Shishida becomes more feral and bestial and mints it when he transforms, although given he's already shown an impressive amount of self-control, I'd say just some extra lessons with Hound Dog should do the trick. Kawaro can enter and control darker black things, but his old schools placed him on watch given his deceitful attitude when paired with such a quirk. Finally, Kamakiri is aggressive, similar to Bakugo, but not to the same extreme, and can make large, sharp, and durable blades grow from his body. All correct. Azawa nodded as he could see Mick and Midnight also forming a headache, as they could see how much work would be coming their way, the final two aren't easy either I'm afraid. One, Hitashi Shinso, is in general education, but made it clear he wants to be in the hero course. He has a quirk called brainwashing, where if he asks someone a question and they answer him, he can make them do whatever he wants, so long as it doesn't take too much brain power on their part. His old schools put him on the watch list, and even rubbed it in his face that he was on a villain watch list. His gen ed homeroom teacher and I have already sent Nezu a report so he can deal with that school. Which meant that the little rat wouldn't be bugging him for a bit either. And the last one you said was support right. Nick looked up after finishing writing the information for the Shinso kid. Right, one may Hatsum. She's a smart inventor, but not only has zero regard for safety regulations, to the point that there are dozens upon dozens of police reports for her setting off explosions in her makeshift lab back home, but she also shows zero regard for the opinions or feelings of others. Or even what she is or isn't allowed to do. There are concerns of her researching or making illegal items because she was bored or curious. Power Loader told me she's already trying to make plans to hijack the sports festival, to turn it into one big advertisement for her inventions. She does know that the sports festival is mainly for showing off the hero core students to potential mentors and the public right. Midnight raised an eyebrow that we let the support students have some gear to show off, but their main thing is the cultural festival later in the year. She knows and she doesn't care. Azawa grunted as he finished his coffee, already wanting another one. One of those, lovely. Kansas grunted as he brought the whole pot over drink up everybody, we've got a lot of planning to do. Nezu. Thank you for coming everyone. Nezu smiled as he had all might pour five steaming cups of tea, the office currently filled with himself, the number one, recovery girl, Sir Night Eye, and Gran Torino, I'm sure you all know why we're here yes. All Might finally made a list of successor candidates yeah. Gran Torino eyed the trembling pro hero, amusing Nezu with how the blonde was still so scared of his old teacher. I did. All Might tried to look confident as he placed a list on the table, I didn't find any standouts amongst the second years sadly, so all the options are from the first and third years. I still insist that Mirio should get it. Sir Night I frowned as he picked up a copy of the list, he's perfect to inherit your legacy. That's not your choice boy, now hush. Gran picked up a copy and read it over. All Might Nezu's voice was strained as he saw some of the choices, I'd like an explanation please. I chose candidates due to either their current personality and heroic ideals, or if they had a quirk that I think would match well with one for all, as they could still develop the right mindset with guidance. All Might admitted as Nezu read over the candidates. Third years Mirio Tagata and Najire Hado were on the list, although the third member of the big three was suspiciously absent. From the first years Nezu saw that the list showed Izuku Midoriya, Tenya Iida, Ijiro Kirishima, Fumikage Tokoyami, Shoto Todoroki, Itsuka Kendo, Kitsuki Bakugo, Denki Kaminari, Tageru Kamakiri, Nirinjeki Shota, Tetsutetsu Tetsutetsu, Ponitsunatori, Nido Manama, Riaiko Yanagi, Ibarra Shiazaki. And Hitashi Shinso. Nearly half of the first-year hero students and even a general education student were all candidates, including seven watchlist members. Why isn't Mirio's friend Amajiki on here? Sir Night I frowned in confusion at the list. 
I've only met the boy once, but even with just that I know mentioning the thought of him becoming the next symbol of peace would probably give the boy a heart attack. All my deadpan. He's not wrong. Recovery girl sighed, the staff well aware of the boy's nerves. Still, we have almost 20 options here. How do you want to handle this? Gran Torino looked at them all as the list was reviewed. I actually had an idea for that. All Might looked incredibly proud of himself as he said that I was thinking that I could easily inspect our two third-year candidates by myself when I help with their class, given it's just those two. But there are a lot of first years. So, I was thinking we could invite various pro heroes to give guest lectures to the hero core students and those wanting to join the hero course. I could even bring in Tsukauchi to give a lecture about how the police and heroes work together. This would let multiple people we trust have a look at the kids in various situations. That's actually smart. Are we sure that's Toshinori there? Gran raised an eyebrow as All Might went to go sulk in the corner. Perfectly valid questions aside. Nezu smiled as he felt All Might sulking grow worse, that is indeed a fine idea. It would even benefit those who aren't on this list. Sir Nidai, could you be ready to give such a lecture first? I believe I can organize time after the classes do their USJ trips. I'll have one ready. The pro promised as the group broke up to plan and strategize, All Might left still sulking in the corner pitifully. Chapter 5. Man. Real quick I want to explain something about this Izuku's behavior. I've shown stated him having his can in incredibly high nerves, but also showing those vanishing the moment he gets pissed off. I know that wouldn't make sense to some a lot of people, so I wanted to establish where that came from. In all honesty, it's based on how I was in my first three years of high school and a decent chunk before. Back then I was very socially awkward and even had a speech issue in that when I got excited or nervous, I talked faster and faster to the point my words ran together. I was awkward, nervous, tended to just stick to myself in the corner with my books and less with my friends I felt comfortable with. However, the moment someone pissed me off I tended to be angry, scowling, and lost all sense of nervousness. It was a common rumor that people thought I was actually going to shoot up a school, given that it usually happened when I was being bullied or said bullies insulted people I cared about, and my glare was, apparently, that much of a throw due to the drastic change it was. So much like that, this Izuku has his usual nerves until he gets pissed off which will cause him to become much more aggressive. It's not a side effect of the transformation, as some people seem to think based on reviews, but something for Izuku himself. A and 2. I haven't heard Riaiko talk in the anime, most of what I know her from is from fanfics, but the wiki says she's very verbose, so I'm doing my best attempt here. I want to start reading the manga to know what I haven't seen in the anime, yet so if anyone knows where I can find the manga for free, in English, it would help. Also, do let me know if there are issues with how I have her talk in this. Chapter 5. Izuku. Picking up his packet, Izuku began flipping through the syllabus, skimming it for the rules he'd need to know, what was planned for the class, and what sort of facilities he had access to. Jime. Izuku finally finds what training facilities he has access to, and quirk training field B. You got Jime too dude. An excitable voice asked loudly from behind as he turned to see his classmate with spiky red hair standing next to the entirely pink girl, both of them flipping through their own packets, same. We should totally go live together. I could use a gym buddy. Buo, I have gym C. The pink girl pouted, puffing her cheeks out grumpily. Sorry Mina. The redeed chuckled sheepishly, well maybe you can find a new friend in gym C. You said I'm your horn buddy, but don't you want a pink buddy? Or an eye buddy? What? Izuku blinked in confusion at the strange conversation they were having, the two of them finally remembering his presence and turning back towards him. Oh, sorry. When I spiked my hair up like this, Mina said how it looked like horns and therefore, I was her horn buddy. I'm Ijiro Kirishima by the way. The now named Riti jabbed a thumb into his own chest. And I'm Mina Shido. The bubbly pinket cheered before leaning in to inspect him, the unexpected closeness making Izuku gulp and back up a step, his nerves starting to bubble back up, hmm, I declare your potential fluffy buddy. Mina pointed a finger skyward before looking at Kirishima Kiri, you are to inspect him for potential as a buddy. Fluffy buddy? Izuku's voice was strained, this whole conversation weird to him. Fluff. Mina tapped her hair before pointing at his own hair fluff. Therefore, potential fluffy buddy. Well, I'm gonna go check out Jim C. You boys don't miss me too much. Mina waves before heading out. Sorry about that. Kirishima chuckled awkwardly, Mina is well Mina. Anyway, I was serious about hitting the gym together. I need a good gym partner, and you look like you know what you're doing when it comes to weights. I am not, really. Izuku admitted, his nerves fully showing themselves as he'd finally calmed down from the state he'd entered after dealing with Mineta's comments, both in the locker room and in the tests. 
Not to mention seeing that Iida guy again and remembering how he treated Izuku during the entrance exam. What? Kirishima gaped even as Izuku started heading to Jime, remembering passing it this morning when trying to find his classroom, Kirishima following after, but you're ripped dude. I just moved a bunch of garbage for community service, I've never actually used a gym. Izuku looked away awkwardly. Then I'll just have to show you what to do. Kirishima nodded before urging Izuku to go faster, getting them to gym A where he saw two other people wearing first-year gym uniforms that he guessed were the students from class 1B that got the same gym assignment. The first was a guy with pointed teeth, not unlike Kirishima, and steely gray hair. The other was a cute girl with pale gray hair and a soft expression. That was all Izuku was able to observe before Kirishima spotted a bench press and drug him over to it, alright Midori bro, do you know how much weight you can lift in either form? Um not really. Izuku never exactly had the chance to see how much weight he was lifting. Then let's start with your base form and go from there. Kirishima nodded and then, when Izuku didn't lay down, started tapping his foot with arms crossed, anytime now Midoriya. Wincing, Midoriya lay down, noting that the bench was wide enough to possibly even let him fit when transformed. Good, now I want you to move the bar, like this. Kirishima demonstrated the proper form, and I'll add weight after each motion till we find where it starts to strain you, alright. Oh okay. Izuku didn't have it in him to say no to Kirishima's exuberance, as the redeed grinned and hardened his arms from the elbow down, and moving the weights will at least get me warmed up. What the heck? Hearing the voice from the other guy in the room, Izuku and Kirishima looked over to see the 1B gym goers staring at them. Or more specifically the girl was staring at Izuku, causing no end of blushing, while the guy was gaping at Kirishima. What's the problem? Kirishima asked confused as the other pointy tooth teenager stormed over. Hardening is my thing. The 1B member's skin suddenly turned into shining metal as he glared at the rock like Kirishima. No, it's my thing. Kirishima butted heads with his counterpart as the two began to argue and bicker, Izuku's training forgotten. As they argued, the cute girl with the gray hair floated over, head tilted as she studied their arguing classmates. It would seem that along with your quirk similarities, a coincidence most shocking, that there is another matter one should give adequate due attention towards. One that would hopefully bring positive bonding joy, rather than the vulgar arguments that are currently occupying yourselves in both action and thought. To characters most beloved to whom you both seem to resemble in capability if not demeanor or visual accuracy. The girl spoke, her tone soft and almost flat, as she stared at the now confused hardening duo. Um Kirishima began. What? His counterpart finished the confused question. She said that you two having quirks that similar is surprising, but she thinks you should be focusing on the fact that you have a connection to some characters that are popular and can be a positive bonding experience. Izuku summed up easily as the 1B duo looked at him in surprise, the cute girl giving him a small ghost of a smile as he flushed. Wait, what characters? Kirishima tilted his head in confusion, even as the other boy started muttering about how, did he understand her so easily. To be blunt the girl pointed at Kirishima Metapod, she turned to her classmate Kakuna. Izuku tried, he really truly did, but at that description, and the two guys open gaping expressions, he couldn't hold back his amused snort. Turning into a full-blown laughter at their indignant expressions. Sorry, sorry. Izuku rubbed the back of his head even as his eyes flit over their own transformed states, besides, your quirks are plenty different anyway. Wait what? Kirishima looked at his heart and arms in what way? And how can you even tell? Izuku sat up straighter, excitement at getting the chance to talk about quirks bubbling up within him, well during our quirk assessment test, I noticed how you only ever hardened what parts you needed to, and always seemed more tired afterwards than just what the exercise should have caused. Since you demonstrated when you tripped and wanted to avoid getting hurt that you can harden your entire body, I was able to figure out that your transformations take stamina. Plus, since I saw you harden different parts to different levels both then and now, I can tell you can adjust the level of hardness your quirk provides. You on the other hand, Izuku looked at the 1B guy whose name he still didn't know, transformed your entire body at once, and don't seem bothered by doing so. I figure that means you've either trained it to the point that a stamina drain doesn't matter, which I doubt you'd have had time to if you're just now entering first year, or yours has a different energy cost. Um yeah. The confused 1B boy dropped his quirk, the iron in my diet supplies the energy for my quirk, which boosts my body's natural strength and durability. Then all you'd have to do is adjust your diet for more iron and carry iron supplement pills, maybe having the school medical staff or the support course make special ones that rapidly take effect, and you'd be able to keep that up for ages. Izuku whipped his notebook out of his bag and started jotting down notes and theories, plus if it boosts your strength, then exercising like this would greatly increase the benefits. 
Not to mention training with that form to increase speed while weighed down by a heavier body would also help. Holy fuck. The metal quirk user gaped at his own hands before Izuku turned back to Kirishima. For yours it would make more sense to focus on your stamina and how hard you can make your quirk. Constantly taking the barrier you're hit and just well push past it, force it to go harder, and then when you hit a new threshold get used to using it. Midori bro you are one scary smart dude. Kirishima and his kinda twin both gaped at him as Izuku flushed and looked away, quickly stuffing his notebook back in his bag. Sorry, I know my muttering and quirk nerding tends to freak people out. He winced, hoping he didn't fuck up his one chance to enter a new school and new school year, without the stigma that Bakugo and his old classmates had given him. What are you talking about dude, that was awesome. Kirishima protested, bringing the notebook back out to put in Izuku's hands, you broke it down just like that. The redeed snapped his fingers with a wide grin, I never really took the time to think about it that hard myself. And I never thought about the iron pills. The other hardening quirk user nodded, name's Tetsutetsu Tetsutetsu by the way. And my name, if introductions are to be commenced between our classes, is Riaiko Yanagi. It is a true pleasure to meet you. I too find your ability to break down and dismantle our quirks on an intellectual level to be most fascinating indeed and would greatly appreciate you doing so for my own power. I am most curious about not only what conclusions you would reach, but in what way you would be able to aid me in improving my own ability and value as a hero. I do find myself wondering most earnestly if this is your quirk, an ability to understand the gifts of others at a glance. If so, it would make you a detective quirk of some renown if that level of in-depth understanding paired over with the rest of your deductive reasoning. The cute girl, Riaiko, spoke up, head tilted even as Kirishima and Tetsutetsu looked puzzled by her words, although he didn't get why, they seemed easy to understand for him. That's not my quirk. He winced, remembering how a lot of his classmates had seemed scared when they saw his furious expression paired with his transformed state, not wanting to scare away these two already as well, but what is your quirk? Talking about other people's quirks, that was safe territory. My quirk is known as Poltergeist, Riaiko informed him as she began to float once again, it grants me telekinetic powers. I am granted full telekinetic control over whatever I choose to with the current weight limit being that of the average human. A telekinetic quirk. Izuku perked up, my mom has one too. And full control. There's so much you can do with that. The areas you'd need to focus on training would be your weight limit, the speed you can move what you control, and the precision. Weight and speed are easy enough, you just work it out like a muscle. Pick up heavier weights, move them faster, and try to beat your best times. For control, he paused to consider it, I suppose getting like a tub of sand and trying to make small sand sculptures. The sand particles should weigh so little that it wouldn't bother your weight limit and it would let you get used to trying to control several things at once. Another option is trying to use your quirk to write notes or draw, that way you're only controlling one item at a time, but doing it with a lot of precision. I thank you for your analysis and suggestions. Riaiko smiled at him, I had already considered working with heavier objects to further improve the limit that which restricts my ability to use my quirk, but the exercises to further improve my control and speed were concepts not yet considered to me. I must ask though, we have yet to hear your name or quirk. Shit, well there's nothing else for it now, my name is Izuku Midoriya, and my quirk. He rubbed the back of his head as he transformed, his body growing and skin darkening, the nubs that he was sure were developing into spikes, pushing out his clothes somewhat. He saw Kirishima smirking at a gaping Tetsutetsu, while Riaiko just seemed fascinated by his more monstrous form. Dude, that's manly as hell. Tetsutetsu started poking one of the growing spikes on Izuku's elbow, so what does it do? As he explained, he noticed Kirishima studying him. Dude, you seemed a lot different this morning when you entered class, when you were doing Azawa's tests, and now. What gives? Kirishima, apparently incredibly blunt at times, asked him as Tetsutetsu and Riaiko looked confused but curious. I don't do well with people. Izuku admitted, Mineta and Iida pissed me off enough that I didn't feel as nervous as I usually would. I know his comment during the ball through was a bit of a dick move, but to piss you off that much. Kirishima tilted his head confused, and what did Iida do? Back in the locker rooms, Mineta and I were the last ones to leave. I caught him trying to find a peephole into the girls' locker rooms and muttering about how to make one if there wasn't already one there. I confronted him about it, and when Iida came back in to see what was taking so long, he instantly decided I must have been bullying Mineta and started harping on me while Mineta took the chance to bolt. His fellow hero students all looked irritated at the story. Totally unmanly. Kirishima scowled. Both of them. Tetsutetsu agreed. Such uncouth fools to so easily fall prey and let vulgar lust consume them as well as pride to not see the truth or even consider there is more than what their own eyes witness. 
Ryaiko had the smallest of frowns on her face as she gave an admittedly verbose opinion on the matter. Thanks guys. Izuku couldn't tell them how much that simple support meant to him, but they seemed to get it, even if they didn't know the reason why. Arg, enough of this heavy shit. Tetsutetsu shook himself, we're in a gym so let's act like it and do our training. Midoriya, I have to know your routine if you're that ripped. I just moved garbage for a bunch of months. Izuku rapidly shook his head, I don't know proper exercise forms. You just moved garbage. Tetsutetsu looked utterly baffled at that. Yeah, a few months ago I was attacked by a sludge villain, it's when I learned my quirk was what it was. I hadn't transformed since the first time I'd gotten it by that point. He looked away embarrassed anyway, the water hose duo saved my life from that villain and got me to a quirk doctor who figured out what my quirk could do. They're the ones who suggested the exercise to build up my body thanks to my healing factor and even pointed me at Tacoba Municipal Beach. You're the one that cleaned that place up Tetsutetsu grinned, so manly. Chapter 6. Man. Real quick I want to make it clear that I don't dislike Iida, I actually really do like his character and how he's grown throughout the canon story. The issue is that Iida did start out the show in a very antagonistic light, to the point Izuku was actively dreading the thought of sharing a class with him. Added to that, this Izuku didn't have the dramatic self-sacrifice moment that his canon self performed, so your Raka and Iida weren't as compelled to seek him out as intently as they were in canon. Iida is a good guy, but he has the issue of a very narrow worldview in the beginning of the show, something being friends with the Deca Squid helped him grow past, but here he isn't friends with Izuku, so that change hasn't happened. And don't worry, I do have a plan for Iida. Chapter 6. Azawa. Alright class. Azawa let out one of his trademarked sighs, feeling as perpetually exhausted as always, you've done well enough so far this week, but today's heroics period is going to be a little different. And he thanked whatever deity existed that it was Friday, and he could have a break from these kids for a bit, Monday you went through my test, Tuesday through Thursday, your heroics periods were based on hero law and other more theoretical fields. But today, you'll be doing something practical. Going over to a chalkboard, he flipped it around to show bombastic words declaring today would be a battle trial, the board something present Mick was making him do thanks to a lost bet. BB battle trials, Mineta exclaimed in wide-eyed shock already sending the cowardly boy a glare, as always silenced the perverted student's blubbering. It was only the fact that the boy did his little stunt trying to make a peephole before as always ultimatum that he hadn't sent him packing already. Although the tension between Mineta and Iida on one side and the trio of Midoriya, Ashido, and Kirishima on the other was drawing attention in the class. It had been more than a bit of a surprise for the seemingly friendly duo of Kirishima and Ishido to tear into Iida before class on Tuesday, about jumping to conclusions and defending a peeping Tom. Yes, battle trials. Class 1B did theirs this morning. Azawa glanced for any signs in his students' eyes that they had picked up a stupid Class AB rivalry that Khan had mentioned several of his own had taken to heart. Makes sense, only so many teachers and we have all our non-heroics courses in the morning. Midoriya muttered to Ishido and Kirishima, the trio having moved their desks together, the request only approved so long as they kept up their work and didn't misbehave during class. Enough, head to training field Gamma. I want you there within 15 minutes. Azawa ordered before more talking or theorizing could take place, your other instructor, and I will explain more there. But first, these came in for you. The button press and 20 suitcases slid out of the wall, each with a number corresponding to deck placement, the first iterations of your hero suits have arrived. Keep in mind that you're supposed to figure out what about these works and what doesn't during your time here. Take any requests or questions you have about the more alterations to the support department. With that, he walked to the observation room for Field Gamma, his tablet showing the tracking beacons placed into Class 1A's hero suits, a stipulation he'd insisted on for any student he taught. Both to help keep track of them in dangerous situations and to make sure no young idiots took them off campus to show off. Hello Izawa. The tired voice of the symbol of peace's real form greeted him as he entered the room, the man's costume hanging off a gaunt skeletal frame coffee. Taking the offered cup, he nodded to the man, not the fondest of All Might's enjoyment of grandstanding for the cameras, but at least accepting that the man was determined to learn how to teach. This should be here within 15 minutes. As Awa told him, keeping an eye on the tablet in case any of the students were especially quick, although some might be here in 10. I'll be ready. All Might nodded, double-checking the assistant robots that UA had provided them to place the students where they were meant to go. Soon enough, the 20 aspiring heroes were in the observation room awaiting instruction. Some of them had practical costumes, such as Kaminari and Aoyama, to take full advantage of their quirks. Some had costumes which needed serious revisions, such as Hagakur and Yerozu, so they could use their quirks without inciting a headache-inducing PR nightmare. 
Some were just for visual aesthetic and could be added to, such as Ashido and Kirishima. Then there was Mineta, who looked like he was wearing a diaper, and Midoriya, who was just wearing a pair of ragged-looking pants. Given the boy's annoyed expression he guessed that there might have been another portion for his top that got misplaced when he submitted the rest. Although the annoyance seemed to be warring with being flustered as several of the boy's female classmates kept sending him glances while the boy's friends teased him in their own way. Alright class, listen up. Azawa's sharp voice cut off any muttering or relaxed atmosphere as they all stood at attention, today, we'll be doing group battle trials, there will be 8 teams. 4 of them will be teams of 2, and 4 will be teams of 3. The teams of 2 will be villains for each of the 4 matches, getting extra time to plan in advance. The teams of 3 won't know who their opponents or allies are, or even what their particular trial is, until the signal to begins, they will be the heroes. Sir, this seems most strange and unfair. Iida broke the silence, chopping the air energetically upon hearing the description of the exercise. Not really, Midoriya spoke up before he could, it actually fits what happens in the real world. Villains always have initiative in this business since, as heroes, we can only respond after someone has done a crime. Whether that be in the immediate or tracking someone known to have committed crimes. Added to that, villains are limited in their teams as they often backstab each other, so most stick with small groups they know they can trust. Heroes though, they often work with people they don't know out of necessity, trusting them just because they're fellow heroes. Added to that, an emergency can typically send out as many heroes as are available if they're needed so it fits. Did I miss anything Mr. Azawa? No, that was well put Midoriya. He nodded to the analytical boy, making a silent reminder to find a good analyst or tactician to help him cultivate that skill further, there are 20 robots here. They are each numbered with the same number on your hero costume's case and will guide you to your waiting area. If you're a villain then they'll take you to a building where your partner will also be, as well as a description of what your trial scenario is. Heroes, once you're in your waiting area the doors will close and won't open till it's time for you to begin. Once that happens, you'll have 5 minutes to meet up with your teammates and find the building where the villains are. Once those 5 are up or one of you enters the building, then a counter for 10 minutes will start ticking down. If that time runs out and you haven't gotten your trial's win parameter completed, then the villains win. Apart from that, each of you will have a roll of capture tape, which can be used to eliminate one of your opponents and remove them from the trial. Once one group has finished theirs, we will move on to the next, the pattern continuing until everyone has gone, at which point we will return to the classroom to watch the recordings and evaluate everyone's performance. Now, follow your robots and impress me. As soon as the students were gone, All Might shrunk back down into his skeletal form. Well, this should be interesting. All Might grunted as they looked at the screen which showed the randomizer the robots were running, as they took the students through various paths to not let anyone know who went where. Think it will be a problem? I hope not. Azawa groaned, seeing the first round had the Midoriya and Shoji as villains against Mineta, Iida, and Kaminari. Izuku. Guarding a bomb. His partner, Shoji, mused aloud as they explored the space they were led to, a five-story concrete building which had a decent view of the training field around them, I must admit I find myself surprised at the cliché. It is only day one. Izuku shrugged, not expecting the first combat test to be all that difficult, we should plan though. What all can your quirk do besides the extra arms? I can make various appendages at the ends of my tentacles. Shoji filled him in whether they be hands, eyes, mouths, ears, or more tentacles which themselves can have an appendage. It was of great use during the entrance exam, allowing me to pick out and find groups of robots to destroy. You could pick things out that clearly. Izuku's eyes narrowed as an idea started coming to him, I think I know how we can win this thing easily. When the heroes get let out, think you can identify the closest one to us. I have a plan. Izuku's grin was feral, eyes shining as his plan formed within his mind's eye. Iida. Man, where is our third person? Mineta lisped out, eyes flitting about fearfully as they made their way closer and closer to the tall building they were told to go to upon the announcement to begin. I do not know. Iida frowned, looking around as he got used to the weight of his armor, although it was admittedly not as heavy as it could be given the armor was more for visual appearances than anything else. When they got the signal to begin all they'd been told was there was a bomb in the building they just had to find and touch within the 10 minute time frame. They weren't even told who their teammates were or the identity of the villains, as Awa pointing out how not all dispatches had perfectly detailed information. I hope it's Yerozu. Mineta let out a small chuckle, I'm sure she'd be a great asset. Before he could reprimand the boy for his obviously inappropriate implication, the sound of footsteps drew his attention as he saw the shirtless and shoeless Midoriya running to catch up sorry, I was a bit further away than expected. Midoriya apologized as they caught up. What? Dang it, I wanted one of the girls. 
Minetta grumbled as Midoriya sent the boy a glare that made the great theme boy whimper and hide behind Ida. Midoriya, do not bully your classmates. He reprimanded as Midoriya rolled his eyes with a scoff. Whatever, we have a plan. Izuku glanced towards the building that was their destination, seemingly trying to make some sort of strategy already. I was going to use my speed to start searching the floors from the bottom up, rushing the bomb once we have it. Mineta is to scale to the top of the building and work down. Iida started going over there, or more accurately his earlier plan, I suppose you could act as a distraction. That is a good plan. Midoriya nodded, before offering a polite hand, simple yet effective. Out of reflex more than anything, Iida reached out to take his partner's hand only to gasp, as the greenie quickly used that to wrap capture tape around his wrist, but mine's better. What the hell? Mineta gaped only to scream when Midoriya charge picked their diminutive classmate up, so he couldn't escape the capture tape. Heroes are captured, villain team wins. Azawa's voice rang out throughout the field as Iida gaped, his mind finally catching back up. But you were one of the heroes. Iida yelled in shock. No, Shoji and I were villains, so we used his quirk to figure out who was closest. I went and took out Kaminari same way I did you too and took his place. Izuku shrugged, a villain is supposed to use dirty tactics and tricks to win anyway. First team, please return to the changing room and take off your costumes. Then return to the classroom and wait for the rest of us. Azawa's orders carried through again as Izuku instantly went to go do so, leaving Iida to fume. Chapter 7. Man. I want to clarify something from last chapters and. I agree that your Raka would have thanked Izuku, I'm not saying otherwise. What I'm saying is that the scenarios would change the end factor. In canon, Izuku saved her life dramatically, shooting into the sky and blowing up the zero pointer with a single blow, shattering most of his limbs, and then still tried to crawl towards robots for a single point. That situation is something that would stick with someone. Combine that with how they got to class around the same time on day one, and she got to thank him, and then start bonding with him, they become closer. Iida saw the self-sacrifice which got him thinking and made him apologize. Now in this story Izuku just moved a rock and carried her away. She'd still be grateful, but it wouldn't be as much of a sticking moment. His self-sacrifice seemed to annoy him more than hurt him, so it wouldn't necessarily get Iida thinking, and he got to class just as it started, so there was no chance for anyone to thank or apologize before more misunderstandings happened. Chapter 7. Izuku. Sitting back in his chair Izuku stretched, the case with his hero costume next to the desk. Did you have to change back before I could get here? Mina pouted at him as she and Kirishima sat beside him, their group having gone second, I want my eye candy. You have Kirishima's abs. Izuku snorted, tossing a balled up wad of paper at Mina as it bounced at the pinkette's forehead. Bleh. Mina made a face curious like my brother. You. 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 Not going there so it is your duty, oh fluffy buddy, to provide me eye candy to sustain your alien queen. Think she'll do this to Tetsutetsu as well. Izuku asked Kirishima, studiously ignoring their bombastic female friend. Probably. The shirtless Riti chuckled, but that might be because she's been hyped all week to meet Tetsutetsu and Yanagi. Didn't they say they were bringing Tetsutetsu's old friend to the karaoke bar too? Izuku frowned as he remembered talking to their friends from 1B in the gym the day before. Yeah, yeah. Kirishima nods as Mina finally stops pouting, that'll be foo before Kirishima could finish, the door opened to reveal Mr. Azawa and the last group, All Might following behind. Alright everyone, here's how this is going to work. Their tired homeroom teacher sent the last team to their seats before gesturing to the board, we'll watch the footage for each fight. Nobody is to talk during those viewings, nobody. As always red-eyed glare made it clear this wasn't something to test him on afterwards, I'll allow any initial questions before I have each side explain the reasoning for their actions, I'll give my own breakdown along with All Might, and then we'll open up for any critiques from you all. That said, here's the footage from the first team. The video didn't take long at all. It showed Izuku and Shoji making their plan, the three heroes leaving their bunker starting points, Izuku taking out Kaminari, Iida meeting up with Mineta, before Izuku took them out as well. Given the time between the other teams arriving he was positive that first round had gone the fastest. And there we go. All Might let out a big belly laugh, now students, any questions or comments before we hear from the teams? Sir. Iida shot to his feet, one hand raised high, and the other chopping mechanically at the air, I feel Midoriya and his partner should be punished for violating both the rules and the spirit of the exercise. Interesting. As always sighed, Midoriya, anything to say in your defense. Simple, what I did never went against any rule we were given. Izuku felt his eyebrow twitch irritably at Iida harping on him again, his friends at his side helping him keep his cool, added to that it plays into what I mentioned earlier. 
heroes trusting people just because they're wearing a cape, trust like that could be easily taken advantage of. Could you elaborate on that young Midoriya? All Might frowned, the Paragon hero probably not used to people saying trust in heroes was a bad thing, except for anarchists and villains at any rate. There are hundreds of heroes in Japan alone. Izuku shrugged, and at least a chunk of all villains were heroes or sidekicks at one point. It makes sense if a hero or sidekick is planning to turn villain, then they'd plan their reveal. But even not counting that there's room for people claiming to be a hero when they really aren't as there's no way to know every hero in Japan without a memory quirk, let alone if someone claiming to be an international hero arrives. Then there are people with illusion, shape-shifting, perception-altering, and mind-control quirks. Like the Golden Sun incident Mr. Azawa dealt with a few years ago. The what? Kaminari frowned in confusion, the lighting quirk user having at least taken his loss better than the rest of that hero team had. A major villain event in Germany a few years ago. Azawa Aiden, likely surprised that Izuku had even heard of it, a villain was planning his reveal and setting up things for a while. His quirk was a mind-controlling one, allowing him to infect a person with his quirk and have them go about their lives until the trigger went off and they obeyed him mindlessly. This villain spent months building a cult in secret and infecting as many heroes as he could in the area he was based in. When he made his move and heroes started coming in to stop him, those not infected weren't prepared for their fellows to attack them from behind. I got called in due to my ability to nullify quirks. I'm surprised you know about that Midoriya. I'm a quirk nerd sir. Studying them, breaking them down. Learning how to improve or counter them. It's something I've been doing for as long as I could understand what a quirk was. Izuku nodded to him as the class muttered about the explanation and the scenario given, but I knew that people trusted like that, so it felt like a good idea. Not to mention I knew that with my quirk, I had a decent chance of escaping should the ruse fail, Shoji staying by the bomb as a precaution. When Shoji figured out who our opponents were it felt more assured as I knew Mineta would latch onto Iida for a plan, and Iida would go by the book. I see. Azawa nodded, and you're right, that is a problem that I hope we can get out of everyone's system while in UA. Hope for the best but prepare for the worst, all of you. Azawa's gaze went around although seemed to linger in Izuku and the back in his seat Iida, and just a heads up that that particular trick won't be allowed in future exercises, as this is meant to be learning how to handle various scenarios. Are we clear? Yes sir. Izuku sat down as the next video started, Iida and his teammates having nothing else to add, and the class having very little to break down. The second fight was Mina and Kirishima as villains against Sato, Hagakur, and Aoyama, where his friends had taken full advantage of their allotted time, utilizing Mina's acid to destroy any stairs for the heroes to climb, while Kirishima used his quirk to break apart rubble for projectiles. In the end, those weren't needed as none of the hero team had a method to get from one floor to the next without the stairs, their one attempt to hoist one person up being met with hail of thrown rocks from Kirishima. Alright then. Heroes, what was your plan going in? We planned to stick together. Sato sighed, we figured Aoyama and I could draw attention and hold the villains in a fight, while Hagakur used the mayhem to get to the bomb. We didn't think they would, or could, destroy a way for us to follow. I see, and villains. All Might turned to a grinning Mina and Kirishima. We have Aizubro to thank. Kirishima slapped his back hard, I never would have thought to use my quirk to make projectiles before. Plus, I could grip the rough edges safely thanks to it. We even planned to have me jump down and fight if necessary, knowing I could get back up thanks to how sharp my fingers get when hardened, they can act as climbing gear. And I never would have thought to use my acid to set traps or destroy ways to be followed. Mina admits, I only ever thought to toss it around me or slide on it. Izuku even thought of some awesome ideas for support gear to use my acid more effectively, aim it, or even store it. At the stunned looks from his classmates Izuku just shrugged like I said, I'm a quirk nerd. Analysis is a skill I've spent years working on. Any suggestions for either group? Azawa looks around as Izuku raises his hand after most of his classmates frown, unable to think of any ideas. Other things Mina and Kirishima could have done would involve using acid to destroy part of the floor around the bomb to make it harder to get to if the enemy team got up the floors or even get it onto the roof. Another idea would be to find a level of acid that would hurt skin, but not Kirishima's heart and form, have Kirishima go to the ground floor and fight, while Mina dripped acid through melted holes in the floor to provide support and sow chaos amongst the heroes. For the heroes I saw Sato boosting his strength yesterday, and Aoyama managed to get propelled with his laser which we saw as strong. They could have had Sato throw the others up or Aoyama use his quirk to propel himself up, or even destroy part of the roof to have another entrance that wasn't being watched. 
The Zuku eyes flit about, fingers rapidly tapping his thumb as he ran through scenarios in his head, tuning out most of what was around him. You also gave few restrictions, so one option would be to have the heroes go into the building next to the one with a bomb and jump from one roof to the next or through a window that they could have broken first. Why yes. All Might coughed, bringing Izuku out of his hyper-focused state, thank you Midoriya. Looking around, Izuku saw the wide-eyed gaping expressions of his classmates at his rapid flow of information. Only his friends, who'd already seen it, and Todoroki, who didn't seem to care, weren't at least looking wide-eyed. Well, he assumed Hagakur was doing the same given how her uniform was positioned for body language. The third team had been Jiro and Tokoyami as the villains against Todoroki, Yerozu, and Kendo as the heroes. Todoroki had frozen the building, entering without waiting for the other heroes to even arrive, resulting in the girls having to run in and help him, Todoroki having been caught off guard when Dark Shadow could still attack him. And Jiro was able to use her vibrations to break the ice around her feet and attack. The heroes still won, but it was a very close thing. The main issue that had been brought up, Izuku not even needing to do so, was that Todoroki failed badly when it came to teamwork. The statement that the ice user didn't seem very satisfied with. The final round, Ajiro and Koda as villains against Siro, Asui, and Yuraka as heroes, had been an interesting one to watch, given how much mobility the hero team had, while the villains were primarily strength-based, given Ajiro just had his tail and no support gear, while Koda's quirk needed animals. On hand to work. The two villains, with what they had on hand, couldn't keep up with the superior numbers and mobility. Izuku's only advice, which others shared, was for Ajiro to get some support gear, and Koda to maybe look into permits for animal sidekicks. The hero team hadn't had enough opposition to really critique this time around. And that's it for the day. As Awa nodded, I'll have your grades from today ready by Monday. Speaking of, be ready as Monday's class will have quirkless barring for your hero period. I want all of you able to function even without a quirk on hand. Dismissed. Sweet. Mina jumped to her feet, linking her arms with his and Kirishima's come on boys, we got things to do. Chapter 8. Izuku. This the place, right? Nina asked, bouncing around as the trio entered the karaoke bar that Tetsutetsu told them to come to, the place apparently a favorite old haunt of the steel quirk user and his childhood friend Tokich. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Kirishima pulled out the slip of paper with the address to check it again. Yo bros. Over here. The ever-energetic voice of Kirishima's long-lost twin, a fact that nobody could convince Izuku wasn't true, shouted from a back booth, waving them over. Hey Tetsutetsu, hey Yanagi. Izuku smiled, waving to his gym buddies, nodding to the greenie who was with them. Said greenie mock gasped upon seeing them, you guys didn't tell me your new friend was a greenie. You trying to replace me Tetsutetsu? Been trying to for years. Tetsutetsu smirked at his friend, but like a boomerang, you always seem to find me again and slap me upside the head. Ryaiko giggled in amusement at that which had the unfortunate side effect of bringing Tokage's attention onto her as Izuku, Kirishima, and Mina slid into the corner booth. Hey, don't think you're off the hook either Yanagi. Tokage smirked, poking the ghost girl in the chest, not telling me that your new friends are a couple of hunky guys. She paused to pointedly eye him and Kirishima up, I must saw, Ro. So, what's the deal Yanagi? Why leave a girl hanging? Or were you hoping to keep these two all for yourself? Any further teasing remarks were cut off by a dango bun shooting off a skewer on their table and stuffing itself into Tokage's mouth, gagging her. Oh lord it's another Mina. Kirishima paled, Midori bro run. There are two of them. Hey. Mina pouted not nice. Smacking Kirishima, and for good measure Izuku, on the head with a menu she proceeded to focus on Tokage who was busy chewing the dango gag, and you, we'll be having words later, talk shop on making our boys squirm and all that. There really are two of them. Tetsutetsu paled, this was a terrible idea. Regardless of the intended result of a first meeting between the rest of this circle of individuals, the outcome that has come to pass should have truly been foreseen by you both at the very least. But the similarities shown with such clarity between the two hardened heroes, then one would expect their old friends to may have share similar similarities, continue the pattern of yin to yang. One can blame not the universe, but only yourselves for not listening to and asking the other of who was to be brought, so plans and preparations could be first made, and not allow them the upper hand which they have so swiftly claimed from you. Inagi declared in all seriousness even as she opened a bottle of soda, taking a refined sip. Ha. Huh? The other four gaped, Kirishima and Tetsutetsu looking to Izuku to translate. You're both idiots who should have figured if you were so similar your best friends might be alike. Izuku translated with a roll of his eyes, and even if you didn't want to rely on thinking ahead, you could have asked what Mina and Tokage were like to plan, so they wouldn't take control of the situation. Now they have so you're both screwed. Eee. 
Kirishima and Tetsu Tetsu pout, sulking as Mina and Tokage cackle happily. Dust them though fluffy buddy. Mina rested her chin on her hands as she leaned over at him, smirking dangerously, even as Tokage copied her position, you trying to say you're not screwed as well. Unlike those two I'm not that easy. Izuku said, managing to keep a perfect deadpan even as Kirishima choked on his drink and Tetsu Tetsu froze gaping. Midori bro. Kirishima whined, looking utterly betrayed, I thought you were supposed to be the nice one. But I am being nice. Izuku smiled innocently, sipping his drink as he sent a subtle wink to Mina and Yanagi, isn't telling the truth a nice and polite thing to do. Smiling in amusement, Yanagi added to the duo's misfortune by setting her phone on the table, a meme proudly displayed declaring stop. Stop. They're already dead. Yutu Yanagi Tetsu Tetsu crossed his arms with a huff, what is this, pick on hardening quirk user day. Yes. The four without hardening quirks all nodded in agreement. It's been declared to happen on any day ending in Y. Mina smiled innocently. Wait, but doesn't every hey. Kirishima shoved his pseudo-sister with one hand as the pincat gave into her giggles, the table falling into happy laughter. So, you guys come here often, right? Izuku decided to be merciful and change the subject, Tetsu Tetsu instantly latching onto the salvation. Yeah, we've been coming here since we were kids. The Iron Man of 1B grinned, they have different hours for younger kids to come in with their parents, but this place is a ton of fun. One of the rules of the place is that if a group comes, they can't leave till at least one person has sung. I figured if we make this a regular thing, we could all rotate who goes when. Not it. Izuku and Yanagi speak up instantly, Izuku planning to go as close to last as he could. Not it. Mina and Tokage pipe up, Kirishima following a moment later before Tetsu Tetsu could. Oh, come on guys, really. Tetsu Tetsu gave them all a look. This was your idea, only fits that you go first. Kirishima grinned happily. I move the Kirishima go next. Izuku smiled. Seconded. Mina declared. Motion carried. Tokage nodded with a mock serious expression. We thank you for your sacrifice Kirishima. Yanagi bowed her head to him. I hate you all. Kirishima joined Tetsu Tetsu in sulking. So, how was your heroics class? Izuku asked a 1B group as he finally decided what he wanted to order, more people trickling into the Karak bar, which would open the mix soon. Pretty fun. Tokage nodded, our exercise was two villains against three heroes to capture a bomb. I got lucky and ended up on a team with Tetsu Tetsu as the villains. Our hero opponents were these three idiots called Kamakiri, Manama, and Bakugo. Izuku tried to hide his flinch at the name, although he was sure everyone but Tokage caught it, those three were more focused at trying to one-up each other than actually stop us. We actually won by wearing down the clock and letting them fight each other. I doubt your teacher was amused. Nina shivered, probably picturing how Azawa would have treated that display. Yeah, Vlad Sensei wasn't very happy. Tokid shrugged before smirking, not like they'd have stood a chance against my quirk anyway. What is your quirk Tokage? Izuku leaned forward, his quirk nerd shining as he saw Aiko and Yanagi grin, likely eager to see someone else get dumbfounded, now that they knew what to expect. It's called Lizard Tail Splitter. Tokage told him, smiling proudly as she described her quirk, I can split my body into multiple pieces, my limit is 50 for now at least. But more than that, each piece can levitate and more freely through the air. They leave and regenerate if they're destroyed, but that's exhausting, so I prefer just joining them back. Holy fuck. Izuku whispered wide-eyed at the quirk as his mind started racing, you can fucking fly. What? No. Tokage frowned confused, my pieces can levitate and move ya, yeah, but I can't just fly. Why not? Izuku demanded, staring her dead in the eye, if you can make your pieces float and fly, then why not do it by itself? It's the same body parts, just one piece. And if you need to separate then split off a single hair or something, it's still technically a body part, and then there will be two parts, so the rest of you can fly. The thoughts and plans came rushing out, Izuku unable to stop them plus with a bit of gear and training, you'd be a monster of a combatant. Some clawed gloves over your fingers, and you could separate them into small flying knives and spears. Work out to improve your strength and your arms could go and attack someone or lift something else while you handle a different issue. With training you could focus on a kicking-based fighting style, while your arms were spear-aid and holding weapons to also attack your enemies, so they'd have to essentially fight three enemies at once. Grappling tactics would be good to learn too if you use your separated limbs like restraints. Nobody was stopping him as he studied, you might even be able to work on improving your regeneration through training or better understanding of your own anatomy. Making it so the regeneration isn't as draining, goes faster, or maybe even works if you haven't separated like you can work on for flight. Whoa. 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 Tokage waved her hands frantically, eyes somewhat unfocused after the rush of information, that that's a lot. 
frowning, he saw one of her hairs split away form the rest of her and float in mid-air, before the rest of her body floated an inch or so into the air. Admittedly it was only for a moment before she dropped back down, possibly not used to floating that much weight, but it proved his theory was sound. Told you he was smart. Tetsu Tetsu grinned, sharing a hardened fist bump with Kirishima. Smart. Tokage gestured to him wildly, that's like calling Godzilla a big lizard, no sense of scale. How the hell did you break down my quirk that fast? I hadn't even thought of most of that. He's a quirk nerd. Kirishima declared as he and Mina throw their arms around him, best one around. And he's all ours. Mina agreed, although he needs a girlfriend so I might be willing to share with you or Yanagi. Mina. Izuku turned scarlet, feeling his face heat up as Mina and Tokage laughed. Now I feel left out. Tetsu Tetsu snorted only to gulp when Mina zeroed in on him. Oh now, we can't have that, can we? Mina gave the iron quirk user a dangerous grin as she drug a finger under his chin. Fiji gotta go sing, bye. Tetsu Tetsu bolted to the stage, Mina and Tokage laughing at the sudden departure, while Izuku had a feeling this sort of chaotic energy was something he'd have to get used to. Chapter 9. Man. If you want to know who voted for who in Class 1A's election check the in at the bottom, I couldn't find a way to say who nominated who without it coming across as an awkward block that would slow down the story, so I just put who got nominated and leave the specifics to the in. Kansas. Striding into the 1B classroom, Sekijiro Kansas looked at his class, all 20 in their seats, even if many were chatting with those nearby. Nothing all that unusual, unless you counted the small tub of sand that Yanagi was using her quirk on, a look of serious concentration on the telekentic's face. Class 1B. He called, his voice drawing everyone's attention sharply to the front of the room, some of the more distracted students jumping startled, having not noticed his arrival, I hope you're refreshed from your weekend and ready to work. Yes, sensei. Most of the class answered as one, Bakugo just huffed irritably as Kansas tried not to openly scowl. The explosive boy was insufferable as a student. He refused to listen, felt he was already the best at everything, and then there was how he fought. Kansas noticed during the battle trial that Bakugo either didn't seem to care about holding back to avoid hurting his classmates too much, perhaps knowing that recovery girl could patch them up, or he didn't seem to understand just how volatile and damaging his explosions could be. He wasn't sure which was worse in all honestly. Excellent. Kansas nodded please now, for most of you, today's homeroom will be a free period to work on any assignments or personal projects you might have. Most of us are. Jirota Shishida asked with a hand raised in the air, the bestial student's face twisted in confusion. Yes, most of you. Kansas nodded, today is the day the various first-year classes get their class representatives and vice representatives. He paused to give them a moment to sink in. Unfortunately, that just allowed various students to start shouting. Clearly I am the perfect fit for such a position. Monoma cackled, his eyes bugging out as he shouted, those around him wincing in irritation at the volume. Fuck off copy-paste. If anyone's gonna be in charge of this shit show it's gonna be me. Bakugo shouted, letting off small but loud explosions from his palms. I'd be a way better pick than you. Kamakiri got riled up at that, the young blade quirk user having focused on Bakugo as a personal rival. Those three troublemakers weren't the only ones shouting, others were lobbying for the position as well, or outcrying the chances of others. Enough. Kansas roared, slamming his fist onto his desk with a loud bang, as his students, even Bakugo, quieted down, I've already decided who will fill the two positions. He was going to allow an election initially, but with certain volatile students he didn't want to risk it, or give them more reason to get angry at their classmates. Juzo Hananuki, Jirota Shishida, please stand up. He ordered as the two wide-eyed boys did so. Monoma seemed to accept this, the copy quirk user thankfully having a lot of respect for most of his classmates, while Kamakiri just seemed satisfied that his rival wasn't chosen over him. Bakugo though. What? Bakugo snarled, hand smoking as small explosions popped from the skin, what the fuck do you mean those extras are in charge? I'm not taking any orders from those side characters. Bakugo, that's enough. Kansas narrowed his eyes, moving some of his blood to encase and harden around the boy's hands to prevent more explosions, you'll be staying after school every day for detention after that remark. Keep letting off your quirk like that and it'll be bumped up to a week. Am I clear? Bakugo grit his teeth, throwing himself down into his seat with a huff. Bakugo, I asked you a question. Kansas glared at the aggressive student, letting out some of the aura that had intimidated countless villains, am I clear? Yeah. Bakugo grunted, still pissed, but with the wind taken out of his sails. Nodding Kansas directed the blood he'd used into a disposal vat off to the side. He didn't want any nitroglycerin from the boy's sweat getting into his body's bloodstream, so that blood was not unusable. Good. Hananuki, you're the class representative. 
along with being one of our two recommendation students, you've shown a level head and put forward good initiative working with your classmates over that first week of school. Shishida, you've shown yourself to be very logical, organized, and disciplined as along with a similar attitude towards teamwork that Hananuki has shown. To both of you and the rest of this class, keep in mind that these positions aren't guaranteed to be permanent. Should you show yourself unfit for the role I can and will replace you. Whether that be when you move on to your second year or partway through the term. Now, I want you both to come with me, we have a meeting with the other class reps to discuss your duties. The rest of you, as I said, have a free period for homeroom. And if I find out anyone misbehaved while I was gone, then they're going to regret it. Azawa. Sighing, Shota walked into his classroom where he his students all divided into their various cliques or doing whatever they felt like whilst alone. Morning. He sighed, not bothering to hide his exhaustion from his students, I hope you lot got more sleep than I did over the weekend. Trying to balance keeping up with the day job of being a teacher and the night job of being an active underground hero he still wasn't sure why he was determined to keep up both full time. But even if you didn't, we don't have time for you to nap. Today we have a very important task that needs to be taken care of. He let it sit like that for a moment, enjoying his students' panicked confusion as they stood in suspense, you'll be selecting a class representative and vice representative. Some of them looked ready to fall out of their seats at the sudden revelation, probably expecting a do-or-die test. How will they be decided sir? Iida had his hand shot high into the air as he asked his question. You all can vote on it. Doing so would put the final choice in their hands and let him gauge who the class looked up to. I would like to nominate myself for such a position. Iida began robotically bowing to the class while others shouted about how much they wanted the spot. What about you Midoriburo? He heard Kirishima ask the greenie in the back, you gonna put your name in? No, I'm one of the three people in the class I think shouldn't be rep. He heard Midoriya deny. Midoriya, explain that. Shota demanded, wanting to know why the boy thought he wouldn't be class rep and who else shouldn't be, still trying to get a solid grasp on the problem child's mints it. The class rep is supposed to be a good example for those looking at our class, as well as someone those in the class can approach with problems. Midoriya grimaced, think of how All Might is supposed to be for most of the pro heroes out there. I, I don't do well with other people I don't know, and I already saw how a lot of the people in this class were put off by me in the battle trial and quirk apprehension tests. Shota noted several people wince uncomfortably at being called out at that, while Iida just seemed surprised at Midoriya's introspective comments, no, I'd be a bad fit. But you said there were two others. Mina tilted her head as Midoriya deadpanned and pointed at Mineta. You all heard the little pervert comment about wanting to instill a regime to dictate what the girls in the class were wearing, so he'd have his fetishes sated. Midoriya's opinion on the purple boy shone through once again, although by now Iida was at least fully grasping Mineta's personality. Granted that meant it was more he disapproved of both Mineta and Midoriya, but it was a start and would hopefully lead to fewer confrontations. And the final one is me I suppose. Iida huffed while rolling his eyes. Yes actually. You're quick to assume, don't seem to listen, inflexible, and are way too intense to be approachable. Midoriya listed without batting an eye as Shota sighed, his hopes for fewer confrontations dashed for now. Enough. He shut this down before it could escalate, here's how this is going to work. Everyone is going to nominate someone other than themselves who they think would make a good class representative. Also, yes, someone can get multiple nominations so pick who you think is the best choice. Those who get nominated have a chance to then step down if they don't wish to fill the position, as it does entail extra work. That took the wind out of the sails of some of them, and then we'll have a vote with those that remain with first place being the rep and second place being vice. We'll go down each row, Yerozu, you're first. The nominations went quick thankfully, although there were a few surprises, such as Yoraka still nominating Midoriya after he stated he didn't think he'd fit the role. And exasperation such as Mineta voting for Kaminari and then getting upset that Kaminari nominated Jiro, shouting at the blonde for wasting their chance to instill the regime together. In the end, nine students had nominations. Midoriya, Kaminari, Kirishima, Shoji, and Jiro all had one vote each. Ashido had two, Asui had three, while Yeirozu and Kendo each had five. Alright, does anyone wish to drop out? Azawa sighed, rummaging in his sleeping bag for another juice pack. I will sensei, I already made my reasoning clear. Midoriya stepped forward with a polite bow while his nominator, Yuraka, pouted with puffed out cheeks. Same here. Kaminari, to his surprise, stepped forward, sheepishly rubbing the back of his head, I'm going to have enough trouble keeping my grades up as is without extra work. Not my jam. Jiro shook her head even as Kaminari pouted at her, the three sitting down as did Shoji and Kirishima, who didn't give their own reasoning. That leaves Yeirozu, Kendo, Asui, and Ashido. 
Shota wrote the names on the board, let's get this done quick as we have a meeting to get to once the reps are elected. Cast your votes and once again, you can't vote for yourself if you're a nominee. The votes were done quickly, everyone who nominated one of the remaining four sticking with those votes, while the rest seemed to be with going what their friends voted for. Bushido went from two nominations to four votes by Midoriya, voting for his other friend and Yuraka, going with what her failed nomination wanted. Kaminari likely just trusted Jiro's judgment and voted for Yarozu like she did. Mineta he was positive only voted for Yarozu in the hopes of getting an inroad to a date later. Siro, thankfully, just seemed to respect Kendo. Excellent. Yeirozu, your class rep and Kendo, your vice rep. We have a meeting to get to, the rest of you study till we get back. Midoriya. Man, that vote was something. Kirishima grunted as they walked around the cafeteria, looking for their class 1B friends, Yuraka having joined them today. I know right. The gravity quirk user smiled, rather friendly even if only at lunch with them on occasion, I still think you'd have made a great rep Midoriya. Not really. Izuku rubbed the back of his head awkwardly as they finally found Tokage, Tetsutetsu, and Yanagi's table, the rest of 1B, nowhere to be seen which, thankfully, meant no Bakugo. Sup. Tokage grinned, flashing them a peace sign as they sat down, y'all get your class reps today too. Who does Awa pick? Pick. Mina blinked confused, we had an election. I almost won. The pin cat sulked, cheeks puffed out grumpily. Midori bro got nominated by Yuraka, but stepped down. Kirishima outed him as Izuku gave him a look. And you stepped down when I nominated you. Izuku shot back, breaking apart his chopsticks to eat, but anyway, it's Momo Yeirozu and Itsuka Kendo who got chosen. What about for your class? Lad Sensei picked our reps for us. Tetsutetsu. Indeed. If I were to hazard a guess and ask to share my beliefs, I would propose that our instructor chose to select our governing representatives himself over an election, for the sole reason of avoiding individuals of certain volatile natures from having a chance to partake in the power which could prove further corrupting. Given the shouting and arguing that were done before he announced he had made a decision and the punishments that followed, I feel my hypothesis is not an unlikely one. In the end, it was the student recommended by the pro hero snatch, Juzo Hananuki, who was elevated to the lofty position as the student representative of class 1B. His aide, our vice representative, is one Jirota Shishida. They are both caring and hard-working students who I believe will throw themselves passionately and diligently into fulfilling the added roles that have undertaken. Ooh. Yuraka's eyes were swimming, the gravity girl having not been on the receiving end of one of Yanagi's sentences. She thinks their homeroom teacher decided to avoid certain students getting the job by picking himself, and that there were fights and punishments given out that supporter theory. Hananuki and Shishida got the jobs, and she thinks they'll do a good job. Izuku translated easily, offering everyone at the table a tub filled with his mom's homemade cookies to share, the group happily digging in. Hmm. These are so good. Tokage moaned, mouth full of chocolate chip I have to meet Mama Daria at some point. I have to. I too would like to meet the woman who raised you. Yanagi spoke, using a short sentence for once as she nibbled her cookie, a notebook next to her, as she practiced writing her name using her quirk to control the pencil. Well, she's been wanting to meet all of you as well. Izuku admitted with a grin, still over the moon at finally having real friends, although his mother had been far more excited, how about the suggestion he was about to offer was cut off as a loud blaring alarm went off. Sending evacuating students into a panic. What's going on? Yuraka shouted, eyes wide. It's an intruder alarm. A panicking third year shouted as he ran past. Fuck, let's get going. Tokage narrowed her eyes, taking charge of the situation as they moved to the evacuation route, finding the hall packed with panicking people refusing to move orderly, more streaming in from behind, only further adding to the chaos. A hard shove from behind pinned Izuku against a window as he saw the intruders were the press all on the front line being confronted by teachers. It's the press. He groaned out, his voice only reaching his friends. I got it. Tokage grinned, her body separating into several pieces and flying overhead, smacking several students to get their attention, yo. Panicking sheeple. It's just the friggin' press. Stop acting like a bunch of babies and file out with some fucking decorum. All for one. Tuckling to himself, all for one ended the call from young Tamura, the lad very proud of himself for breaking into UA to get the schedule for the school's upcoming visits to the USJ. That boy is too cocky. His doctor sighed, are you going to allow him to be the one who makes use of that intel? One of the others might be better. You may be right. All for one thought about the five acolytes he had trained, five powerful figures each with their own empires and armies at their disposal. None of that mattered at the moment though however he is young and needs to grow, how can that happen if he never gets to go try things for himself? Plus Tamura is not yet ready to learn of the other four, not yet. 
giving his intel to another may be better in the short term, but cause problems in the long term. Tamura shall have his chance, he shall have a Nomu, and even if he fails, it will send a declaration of war. And? For the class 1 a nomination we have as follows. Aoyama nominated Asui. Ajiro nominated Kendo. Shoji nominated Kendo. Hagakur nominated Mina. Mina nominated Yeirozu. Aminari nominated Jiro. Jiro nominated Yeirozu. Endo nominated Yeirozu. Asui nominated Kendo. Hiroshima nominated Mina. Siro nominated Shoji. Midoriya nominated Kirishima. Iida nominated Yeirozu. Hoda nominated Asui. Okoyami nominated Asui. Mineta nominated Kaminari. Iraka nominated Midoriya. Sado nominated Kendo. Todoroki nominated Yeirozu. Yeirozu nominated Kendo. Chapter 10. And, to clear up some confusion, the other four acolytes aren't Ox. One is an existing character from DC that I'm importing over, I have another character I'm thinking of bringing over too, who I think would be a good fit. The other three are all existing MHA characters I'm expanding on and giving more time to shine for lack of a better word. Azawa. Alright everybody, file in. Kendo shouted, their class making their way to a bus to head to another facility on campus, most everyone in full hero gear, and if you don't behave correctly, then I'll smack ya. Her hands enlarged to emphasize her point. Endo, don't threaten your classmates unless they warrant it. Azawa sighed, and I mean that it better be warranted. Yes, sensei. The nervous orange tea nodded, helping herd everyone onto the bus, Yerozu trying to tell Iida that a seating plan wasn't really necessary for the trip. Hearing a surprisingly loud batch of laughter, he turned to see a grumbling red-faced Midoriya in his gym clothes sulking, while Kirishima showed a photo to Ishido and Yuraka, the girls leaning on each other as they laughed hysterically. Come on guys. Midoriya groaned, it's not funny. You're right. Ishido cackled. It's hilarious. Yuraka finished, wheezing. Something you wish to share with the class. Azawa drawled as he approached the boisterous group. Don't you dare. Midoriya glared at Kirishima who was still holding a phone. The support department messed with Midori Bro's hero costume again. Kirishima wheezed. I had a feeling just a pair of pants wasn't the look you'd intended for. Azawa looked at his green-haired student, the boy oscillating between being irritated and embarrassed, what was it this time? A speedo. Izuku buried his face in his hands while his friends kept laughing, with with plus ultra written on the back and a comic book pow thing on the front. Damn the power loader. Azawa felt his eyebrows twitch, do you know why your costume keeps having this happen to it? I don't know. The problem child looked close to tearing his hair out, I didn't ask for a difficult costume. I just wanted something that could grow with me when I transform and said I didn't really need any special support gear for it given my quirk. Yeah, that'll do it. Azawa sighed, pinching the bridge of his nose as the four students looked confused, a lot of the support students take a great deal of pride in their work. Anyone saying they don't need support equipment, no matter how warranted or not that statement is, tends to offend them. Some might be trying to alter it to add the support gear regardless, others are just being petty. I'll talk to the head of that department about it. Thank you, Sensei. Midoriya nodded, but until then, I'll just use the UA gym clothes if that's alright. I'll make sure the other teachers are aware in case they have to take over one of your heroics courses. Now you four, get on the bus. Yes, Sensei. They nodded in unison before scrambling onto the bus to get what seats were left. Seeing them rush off, still laughing and teasing, Azawa felt memories from his own time at UA start to rise up before he ruthlessly suppressed them. He didn't have time for nostalgia or the pain that came with it. Izuku. Leaning back against his seat, Izuku noted the tense and awkward atmosphere in the bus, everyone having noticed he and the others getting on last after speaking to their teacher. Most of the class having shown awkward silence around him like this ever since he pointed out their reactions to him on Monday. Okay, this is getting annoying. Nina groaned before clapping her hands loudly alright kitties, this silence is getting really old, real fast. Since I don't want this to become a mime training course instead of a hero training course, I declare that you lot may ask any three questions for myself or my fluffy buddy to answer. Mina. Izuku sent her a look for her offer, but got waved off. Just roll with it bro, Mina is Mina. Kirishima chuckled with bemused exasperation. I'll go first then, Ribbit. Asui raised a hand I'm just going to be blunt. Your attitude seems kinda weird, why do you keep changing attitude rapidly? Bipolar asshole. Mineta muttered as Izuku, about to try and stutter out an awkward answer, snapped towards Mineta with a piercing glare. Like that. Asui nodded, satisfied at the example of his attitude. I'm not that good with people. 
Izuku ignored the eye roll Kirishima, and Mina gave at that statement, or your rock is confused head tilt, I also tend to have a bad stutter, unless I'm excited or... or pissed the hell off. Kaminari grimaced, probably remembering one of the times Izuku had gotten irritated while transformed. I spent years bottling everything up, trying to keep my head down so I wouldn't get in trouble. Izuku scowled as he remembered his old school. Still unsure of just how thorough the cops he spoke to with the power hose couple would be in looking into the quirk discrimination and bullying there, and once I stopped bottling it all up, I... You have a short fuse. Azawa sensei interrupted, surprising Izuku along with his classmates who thought the man had been napping, it's not uncommon. You likely need to have session with Hound Dog about it, but you wouldn't be the first. Yes sir. Izuku decided to try and keep an open mind, Azawa had been better than his old teachers by far, so he'd give this guidance session at least a chance. Alright, question number two. Hagakur was bouncing in her seat, or at least he was pretty sure she was bouncing. It was rather hard to tell when she was only wearing a pair of shoes and gloves AI and now he was picturing it and getting flustered, brilliant. I still don't really get what your quirk does besides make you big and gray. My quirk is called adaptation. Izuku noticed everyone in the class who didn't know listening intently, basically anything I go through that doesn't kill me, makes that transform state stronger. If I get burned, then it's more resistance to burns once I heal. I take blunt force damage, it becomes more resistant to that next time. Added to that, both my transformed and untransformed states build up my resistances, although only the transformation can make use of them. I also have a minor healing factor, at least that's how the quirk doctor described it, which helps me heal from whatever I'm having to adapt to. The adaptation only comes into play once I've made that recovery. Whoa. Hagakur gate that's... intense. Kaminari picked up, the electric user sparking slightly, although Izuku wasn't sure whether that was from nerves or being hyped up, so the longer you're in the hero game the more powerful you're gonna get. Like some kind of unstoppable juggernaut. Maybe eventually. Izuku rubbed the back of his head sheepishly, unsure of how to handle his classmates' reactions. I'll take the last question. Kendo spoke up, the orange tea he'd met on day one having spoken to him occasionally, but they hadn't honestly interacted all that much since then, have you learned an actual fighting style to go with your quirk yet? Midoriya you will be learning a marital art god, that. Kendo asked, eyes narrowed while Ajiro nodded beside her. Careful Midoriya Kaminari snickered, you might just be getting drafted as their personal punching bag. The blonde snickers were cut off by a sharp slap upside the head from Jiro. Children, behave. Azawa flashed a red-eyed glare as everyone on the bus let out a gulp, we'll be arriving there shortly. This facility we're coming to is designed for disaster rescue training, so it's not a playground. If you misbehave and goof off there is a very real chance of injury, so if I see anyone failing to show the proper restraint here, then there will be consequences. Am I clear? Yes, sensei. Izuku and his classmates all answered as one, the response satisfying their teacher as they rounded a corner and started approaching a massive domed building. Stepping off the bus, Azawa smirked up at the structure, problem children. Welcome to the USJ. Must you call your students that Azawa? A voice both bemused and exasperated caused Izuku to turn, seeing a woman in a puffy space suit exiting the building. Behind him, he could hear Yuraka give a fangirl squeal, gushing to those around her about his 13 was her favorite hero. I'll stop saying it when it stops being true. Azawa gave an uncaring shrug at that before looking around, where is All Might? He should have been here already. He got held up. Izuku frowned at hearing that, his frown deepening further with confusion as he saw 13 hold up three fingers, the sight of them making Azawa look irritated. The pro rescue hero then turned to the students, the feeling of her smiling permeating even through her thick black mask, hello students, as I can tell some of you are aware, I'm the pro hero 13. Before we begin, let me just say one thing well, maybe two things. Possibly three. Or four or five. Izuku wondered if this was a regular thing with her before she shook herself anyway, listen carefully. I'm sure you're aware that I'm in possession of a powerful quirk known as Black Hole. With it, I can suck up anything I point my fingers at and turn it into dust. Yeah? Yuraka gushed, you've used Black Hole to save countless people from all sorts of disasters before. The bubbly brunette was damn near vibrating in place in a manner that in no way resembled himself, nope, not at all. Yes, that's true. Thirteen nodded, but it could also be easily used to kill. The air became quickly serious at that I'm sure many of you are in a similar position as well. In our superhuman society, quirks are heavily regulated and watched by both the pro heroes and the government, which means it's not uncommon to not think about how dangerous we could really be. One slip up, one lapse in judgment, one instance of using a bit too much power, could result in a mistake you can never take back. During Azawa's fitness test, you likely got a good grasp of what your quirks can do. 
During All Might's combat training, you may have seen how volatile your power can be when used on another person. Carry those lessons learned over into my class. Here, you won't be using your power to fight, you won't be competing against one another. Here, you'll be learning how to save people's lives. As that is what being a true hero is all about, ensuring the safety of others. Her team is so cool. Yuraka gushed behind him and he couldn't disagree. That's all I have to say, thank you for listening. Their instructor gave a bow as Izuku and his classmates clapped for the speech. As the class's applause died down though, applause from further in became easier to hear. My, my, my. Looking past his teachers and into the central courtyard of the facility, Izuku saw a pale man covered in severed hands, giving slow mocking applause, that was quite the speech 13. It was so fucking wholesome I almost choked on it. Chapter 11. Izuku. Who are you? Azawa narrowed his eyes at the figure, what are you doing here? Why? The madman chuckled, there are only two reasons why someone goes to a school. They come to learn or to teach. The pale man spread his arms, dark hellish fog appearing behind him as more and more figures stepped forward. Most bore distinct quirk mutations, all bore sadistically gleeful grins, and I'm here with a lesson for all the kiddies that want to play hero. Playing indeed. A deep voice echoed from the fog as it shifted, forming the crude form of a man, glowing yellow eyes shining from its dark depths, the only real heroes I see are 13 and Eraserhead. Our sources said All Might should have been here as well. It's so rude of him. As the man covered in hand spoke, Izuku narrowed his eyes, recognizing someone grandstanding, putting on a show. This wasn't the real villain self, this was an act to him, a game. The villain wanted to be seen a certain way, so he was deliberately putting on a show. We go through all the trouble of getting so many new friends who wanted to meet him, and he doesn't even have the common decency to show up. Perhaps if I kill off a kid or two, All Might will hurry up. AK kill us, Mineta squeaked the diaper-like bowl on the pervert's costume, possibly coming in handy for once if his whimpering was any indication, T the teachers will stop them, right I don't wanna die. Shut up. Izuku snapped, eyes narrowing as he stared down at the villains who didn't seem to care about the class being there, who felt secure enough to monologue without fear, your whimpering isn't going to help anyone. Hey, why aren't the alarms going off? Yeirozu questioned, the group huddling closer together as 13 ushered them back, as Awa readying his capture weapon. They must have a quirk that's masking their presence. Todoroki spoke, expression apathetic, or they've managed to attack the entire campus at once. No, that fog is someone with some sort of transport quirk. Izuku focused on the group, seeing how ragtag several of the villains seemed, some clustered in tight groups, others swaggering about on their own, if that's their way in or out, they'd want him watching the group just in case. Good thinking Midoriya. Kendo nodded before glancing over her shoulder Kaminari, is that radio for show? No, but I still can't get through anyway. Kaminari frowned, bouncing one leg rapidly as he held his sparking hand to the radio over his ear. Meaning technopathy or electricity based quirk. Izuku summed up. Good work. As Awa tensed, goggles and weapon in place 13, get them out of here and get me some backup. I'll deal with this trash. What? Izuku blinked, stunned at their teacher trying to fight them on his own, especially when everything Izuku knew about the man showed that he worked best with stealth or one-on-one. -on -one. Hell, even just standing up here to nullify the group while 13 used black hole on them sounded more viable. But also too lethal and with a risk of backfiring if there was someone with a quick that could counter it that Izawa wasn't able to nullify. Trust me Midoriya, you can't be a pro with just one trick. Azawa sent a confident smirk over his shoulder, and in that moment, it was as reassuring as All Might's famous smile, as it carried a message all its own. Azawa was their teacher, and anyone who wanted to hurt his students would need to claw their way past a man to even try. Pick their ass and say. Kirishima grit his teeth, the redeed looking ready to throw down, only held back by 13 blocking his path. Pound on it. Azawa gave a thumbs up before he shot forward like a bullet, charging towards the villains, as 13 forced their class to run back towards the doors, not about to waste the chance their homeroom teacher had bought them. They were barely halfway back when a swirling black gate appeared on the ground in their way, fog rising up with those piercing yellow eyes. The valiant attempt children, but there is no escape for you. The refined echoing voice escaped the fog I must say, it's a pleasure to meet you. Students of UA Academy, some of the best and brightest in Japan, the shining future of our country. We are the League of Villains, here to grace you all with a lesson on the reality of the world. Yet I see our deal symbol of peace has failed to show up, how rude of him to cut class. There must have been a change of plans, but it doesn't matter. The fog spread like macabre wings, I still have a role to play. Go to hell. Todoroki's cold apathetic voice bit out even as ice rushed towards the smoky figure, encasing them in a cocoon of frozen spikes. Ha. Nice one Todoroki. 
Kirishima grinned, arms heartening from adrenaline, did you assholes really think we were just gonna let you tear this place apart? The dark chuckle was the villain's answer, smoke escaping from the fog, as it seemed to condense at the top of the spikes, you truly do live up to your school's reputation children. Still, you should be more careful. Otherwise someone might get hurt. Get out of the way now. 13 shouted, Izuku realizing that by having tried to stay at the back to stop any attacks from the rear, she was now prevented from protecting them without risking their lives up here. I'll scatter you across this facility. The fog figure spread its form wide, tendrils of darkness shooting out, surrounding and the men whipping up the winds, to meet my comrades and your death. Yuraka. Groaning Yuraka sat up, seeing a wincing shoji withdrawing his extended tentacles from where the wall of shadows had been, several of the branching limbs ending in bloody stumps. At her side, she saw he also managed to grab Iida, Siro, Aoyama, Kirishima, and 13. Hmm, it would seem more of you managed to escape my warp gates than I anticipated. The void-like figure chuckled, I do so love surprises. They keep things entertaining. Iida. Hearing the commanding voice of her idol, Yuraka glanced back to see 13 was staring dead at the villain, even while talking to the engine quirk bearer, I have a job for you. Yes, 13. Even in the dire situation, or perhaps because of it, the Bespicult student seemed eager to latch onto the instructions of an authority figure. I need you to run back to the school and get help. Whoever is jamming our communication, it hasn't stopped even with eraser head cancelling quirks left and right, they have to be well hidden. It would be faster for you to go and get help than for us to find them. 13 gave her orders as Yuraka felt a surge of hope, Shoji had managed to get the perfect person to escape and help them. But but, I can't. Iida protested, it would be disgraceful to just run away and leave you all behind. To run away like a cow his statement was cut off by a harsh backhand from Aoyama who, for once, wasn't smiling. Then stay here, act brave and we can all die. The Frenchman spat, clutching his stomach as if in preparation, Yuraka remembering him mentioning pain from using his quirk for more than a second, our classmates, our friends are out there fighting for their lives while you protest getting help. We'll tear those gates open. Shoji growled, new arms growing even as blood coated her massive classmate's body, so you'd better do your job too. But Aida began even as everyone ignored him, Yuraka slapping him harshly on the back. There, I took your gravity. She tried to keep the focus she saw in 13, even if she knew full well she was faking it zero, you thinking what I'm thinking. Yuraka, you're a mad genius. The tape user let out a grin, catching on to her plan as she and her classmates let out battle cries, charging the villain from all sides as she could feel his sneer. Even if it is your only option, do you truly think it wise to strategize in front of your enemy? The fog blasted forth more bursts of darkness. It won't matter if you know what we're planning or not when I'm done with you. 13 suit snapped open a finger cap, the wind tugging at Yuraka's hair, as the dark clumps of mist and fog were sucked into the pro hero suit black hole. Black hole. The fog figure seemed to be pouring out more and more mist, possibly trying to make a barrier to shield himself from 13's quirk, the quirk that can suck up anything and turn it to dust. A truly astounding ability a shame it's wasted on one such as you. One who avoid combat, focuses on saving people from nature's wrath. It's left you with next to no fighting experience, Yuraka saw the smug gleam appear in those yellow eyes or battlefield awareness. As he spoke, a warp gate appeared at his front and 13's back, her suit cracking apart from the redirected force of her own quirk, you've turned yourself to dust. I'm sorry, 13's weak voice was barely heard over the dying wind as her quirk cut off, her body falling limply to the ground, he got me. No. Yuraka screamed, charging at the monster that had just done that to her idol. B to go. Shoji let out a savage snarl, charging with her and Kirishima, while Siro wrapped a string of tape around Iida, swinging him for momentum to throw at the doors. How cute, a she thinking it can escape the wolves. The fog figure laughed, focusing on Iida as Siro threw him, the wide-armored student flying at the doors, propelled even faster when he finally turned on his engines. All I see is a mangy dog. Shoji yelled, leaping at the warp gate appearing in Iida's path, actually cocooning it within his wing-like membranes, showing the warp gates acted like fog, rather than just looking like it. You insolent pests. The warper snarled, flaring out his shadowy body, stretching like a striking cobra towards a running Iida, I've had enough of you. And we're sick of you. Yuraka snarled, running up and slapping her hands on the metal brace she saw gleaming even through the fog, feeling her quirk take effect, meaning her hunch on him having a physical body had been right, keep running Iida. She shouted, throwing the villain skyward, Siro launching some tape to make a rope. Now get lost. Kirishima grabbed Siro's tape rope, swinging it around as he hurled the missed villain skyward, the group managing to buy Iida enough time to escape out the door and back towards campus. 
They didn't have much of a chance to celebrate though, as the shadowy figure vanished through one of his own warp gates. The sudden change in something affected by her quirk dropping Yuraka to her knees, bile surging past her lips as her classmates rushed over. Some to check on her and the others to try and help 13. She wasn't sure how long she knelt there, heaving out her breakfast and trying to make the world stop spinning, before an angry roar snapped her from her thoughts. Feeling Kirishima pull her up onto her feet, Yuraka walked over to the top of the steps to look into the courtyard, where she could see Azawa laying on the ground unmoving, and Midoriya charging in, transformed and furious. Man. Next couple chapters take place roughly during the same time as Yuraka's segment here so don't worry, you will be seeing what Izuku does during the USJ, just not at this chapter. I have multiple parts planned out for this bit. Chapter 12. Man. Sorry about the delay on updates everybody. I had the unfortunate cocktail of getting several new games at once and a severe case of writer's block where I wanted to write but couldn't muster the motivation or energy to do so. A and 2. Here's the second of the three chapters that take place during the same time space. This one involves the other members of class 1A, Izuku's perspective will be back next chapter. Chapter 12. Kaminari. She it. Kaminari screamed, the oppressive black miasma vanishing as he was suddenly falling face first towards a massive lake, a few various figures already swimming around into it. Clenching his eyes shut, Kaminari forced himself to keep a tight grip on his quirk, not wanting to risk zapping any of his classmates that might have come through too once he landed in the water. Opening his eyes with a wince from the harsh impact, he had to stop from letting out a scream and taking in water when he saw a villain with a shark quirk rushing towards him. Nothing personal kid but it's time to die. The shark guy shouted, mouth opening wider than Kaminari thought possible, certainly big enough to bite off a nice chunk of one a student. Hey Kaminari. The happy voice of Tsu called out as she slammed feet first into the side of the shark guy's head, Yerozu holding on to their classmate for dear life as Tsu shot her tongue out at him, the long appendage wrapping around his appendage as she shot off through the water. Pulling him along behind Siya. She shouted cheerfully behind at the villain zooming away. Thank you Asui. Yerozu panted as their amphibian classmate dropped them off on the deck of the yacht that was in the lake. Call me Tsu. Sue scolded, climbing up the side of the boat after them, more and more aquatic villains breaking the surface of the lake. Sue I could kiss you. Kaminari panted, looking at Sue like she was the greatest person to ever live. And now's not the time. Sue blushed, flustered by his comment as Kaminari followed suit once he processed what he'd blurted out. We need a plan though. Yerozu winced as she got up, wringing the water out of her hair, there are a lot of villains down there. Kaminari, you have an electricity quirk, correct? Could you use it to take care of the villains down there? Not without hurting you too as well. Kaminari scowled, hating the fact that he couldn't aim his quirk yet, that he couldn't use it without hurting his friends if they were too close. I can generate electricity to coat myself or release it in blasts, but when I release it the energy just goes everywhere, I can't aim it. I couldn't even just jump back into the lake since I'm not immune to electricity so by charging that lake I'd probably kill myself. Definitely not doing that. Sue shook her head firmly, but what can we do? I don't know if I could jump all the way across the lake while carrying you both. I got it. Yerozu clapped excitedly as she scrunched her eyebrows in focus, a glow coming from her exposed skin, as a length of shining chain started emerging from between her breasts. He only got a split moment to see this before Tsu slapped a hand over his eyes with a startled ribbit. This chain is solid aluminum which is highly conductive. Could you hold the chain and use that to shock the villains into submission? I should be able to. Kaminari nodded from behind Tsu's hand, if I'm careful I can do just enough to take them out without killing them. And once the charge stops it should be safe enough for Tsu to jump us most of the way across the lake. Sounds like a plan to me. But what do we do when we get out of the lake? Tsu asked, Kaminari able to picture her tilting her head as she thought aloud. We try to regroup back at the steps with the rest of the class. Yerozu declared confidently as he heard the sound of rattling chains stop, implying that she had finished pulling metal out of the ether. What about all the villains out there? Sue asked, finally releasing Kaminari's face as he picked up the length of chain that had a large weighted end, they came here to kill All Might. If they went through all the trouble of getting this many people and breaking in here, they probably have some sort of plan that they think would work. Then we wouldn't stand a chance. Kaminari was fucking terrified and was not afraid to admit it, but what we can do is get with our class, get the flying fuck out of here, call for backup, and watch with some popcorn as All Might turns the villains into a large puddle of goo. You don't want to fight. Sue looked somewhat surprised at him. Azawa is a pro, I'm going to trust he can handle himself. We'd only get in his way. Kaminari shook his head as he got the chain, now you two get as far from me as you can, I don't want to risk shocking either of you. 
Once the girls were far enough away, Kaminari started swinging the chain, throwing it towards the water, as the villain started laughing and jeering. The missed brat. The shark one, half his face a massive bruise, shouted with a smirk. Shocking, I know. Kaminari grinned before lighting up the chain, the energy spreading out visibly through a chunk of the lake, as the villains all yelled, spasming and jerking before blacking out. Thankfully they wouldn't drown if they were breathing underwater before he arrived. Your puns need some work Kaminari. Sue pointed out as she and Yerozu appeared, a finger at the frog girl's mouth as Kaminari pouted. That's mean Sue, that's just mean. Kaminari grumbled as he started drawing his chain out of the water, his quirk shut off as he gave the water a chance to lose its charge and be safe for Tsu to jump them back across. Kendo. Grunting, Kendo landed with a hard slam, Ajiro falling down beside her as they found themselves in a city on fire, various villains cackling and sneering as they flexed their quirks or weapons. You alright Ajiro? Kendo asked, dropping into a stance as she enlarged her hand. Never better Kendo. Her fellow martial artist grunted, cracking his neck as his tail lashed out like a whip I mean, look at this gift that missed guy gave us. The villains were looking confused as Kendo picked up on the banter to throw them off plan. All the targets we could ever want to test our fighting styles on and work out all this frustration. Kendo agreed with a cheerful but savage smirk. Shall we fight our way back to class then my lady? Ajiro cracked his knuckles as his tail smashed into a garbage can and caved in part of the metal, the various villains and thugs suddenly looking a lot less sure of themselves. We shall indeed. Whoever takes out the most thugs wins a smoothie. She offered the banter and goal to focus on helping distract her from the sheer pants wedding terror of having a horde of villains wanting to kill her. You're on Kendo. Ajiro nodded before they charged the thugs, limbs lashing out to fight their way out of this flaming hellscape. Tokoyami. A mad banquet of darkness indeed. Tokoyami snarled, Kota hiding behind him as Dark Shadow thrashed around the squall area. The dark environment providing power for Dark Shadow, while the building lights and occasional flash of artificial lightning provided enough light to keep his quirk from going out of control. Glancing over his shoulder, he saw his soft-spoken companion by a few unconscious thugs, Are you alright Kota? He asked, the rock-like quirk user giving a shaky thumbs up, then let's push on. Our companions need us. Todoroki. HMPH. Todoroki let out a scoff as he landed in what looked like a recently finished landslide, broken trees and shattered stone all around him, as villains stepped out from whatever bit of cover they could. Seriously? All they sent us was a little candy cane brat. One of them sounded upset at this, they couldn't have sent us a hot chick or something. There had to be one or two stacked ones. Todoroki's expression went from cold to arctic. I spread like wildfire, racing out as it covered the landslide zone, freezing the villains in place, as only their faces were left uncovered. You know. Todoroki approached one of them, venom dripping from his tone, as the villains cursed and struggled against their frozen bonds, long-term exposure to ice of that extent would be quite bad for your health. Hypothermia will likely kill cells if it goes on too long, so why don't you answer my questions? W what the hell are you? The villain he chose to interrogate whimpered in wide-eyed terror. First, how do you intend to kill All Might? Todoroki ignored the villain's terrified query, idly noting a bright flash of lightning over by a lake in another part of the USJ facility. I'd answer before certain bodily parts are permanently lost from frostbite. Mina. Ow, my ass. Mina groaned, rubbing her sore rear as she landed on the concrete floor of a ruined building, Jiro and Sato landing by her. I can rub it and make it feel better. A creepy lizard-looking villain shouted as they leapt down from the ceiling. Stranger danger. Mina screamed, lashing out with an acid-coated kick as the villain yelled, getting kicked out the window with a terrified yell. That that was too easy. Jiro frowned, her extendable earlobes lashing out as Appa cooped more villains, while Sato put a fourth in a headlock, not even needing to bust out his sugar. These guys are all super weak. Sato frowned, they can't just think that numbers will be enough to kill All Might right. Unless they have a few stronger ones in the courtyard. Mina tried thinking about it, she might not be as smart as Midoriya, but she was no idiot most of the time. That warp gate guy was strong. Sato started beating more of the thugs, using a hardening quirk thug as a bat to smack them around, and their leader is probably stronger if the warp gate guy isn't giving the orders. And who knows how many other strong ones there are. Jiro nodded, one of her lobes stabbing into the wall, most of them are running away after seeing Mina punt one through a window well covered in acid. So, what do we do now? Sato frowned, hand going to his sugar packets. What else? Mina gave a fist pump, we're heroes. Let's see if any of the others need help and then go get the teachers. Right. The others nodded, glad to have a plan. Chapter 13. Man. Addressing some reviews I got last chapter. Chapter 12 wasn't a filler chapter or pointless as some people seemed to think and claim. 
If there's ever a chapter in my stories, then it's there for a reason. Some, like last chapter, are important to set things up for upcoming chapters. Some are designed to introduce new characters or show character growth. Even chapters that are just things like comics are used to go over an issue with a story and give some heads up to the readers. A and 2. Also, yes, I rewatched certain scenes for writing this chapter the bunny girl villainess was actually there in the mountainside zone I cannot make this shit up. A and 3. And for what I have Mineta do in this chapter, seems pretty fitting for his comments and actions during the USJ in canon. Chapter 13. Bizuku. D.E.L. Mineta's high-pitched screams made his position quite clear as they fell from the mist, Hagakur's flailing gloves and boots doing their job to let him note where the invisible girl was as well. Transforming, Izuku adjusted his position to shoot down faster, reaching out with his enlarged hands to grab Hagakur and Mineta. Brace for impact. Izuku's deeper voice shouted to them over the wind and Mineta's cries, bracing as he landed with a boom. You too alright. Izuku grunted, setting them down as gently as he could, ears perked as he listened for any villains in the area. I am fine Midoriya. The shaken Hagakur nodded, gloved hands ringing. I don't want to die. Mineta sobbed while clutching his hairballs, I haven't even gotten to kiss a girl or touch a boob yet. Better grip Mineta. Hagakur snapped even as Izuku noted several villains stepping into view on the mountainside area, others quite literally popping out of the ground. I'm not dying without getting to grope a girl yet. Mineta was wide-eyed as his head swiveled between Hagakur and the villains, particularly one who was wearing a white bunny girl suit for some reason. Eventually Mineta leapt at Hagakur, whether that was because she was technically naked or because he was scared of the bunny girl villainess, Izuku wasn't sure. Either way, Mineta had apparently decided that he'd grope a girl no matter what before he died. Unfortunately for Mineta, Hagakur was not on board, lashing out with a fist to his nose as the rather useless pervert rolled on the ground. Stay behind me. Izuku ordered Hagakur, readying his fists as more and more villains surrounded them, Izuku counting 26 right now, at least half carrying some sort of bladed weapon from knives to sides. He thinks he can keep her safe, how cute. One of the villains, this one looking like a bizarre humanoid chicken, sneered while spreading his arms, looking ready to fight. Let's get a guy with ratty clothes and a knife started to charge eagerly, before Izuku threw a hard punch, his fist bigger than the man's head, as the thug got knocked out by the hard blow. Bet him. A stone golem looking man in the back shouted as the villains charged, several of them getting in the way of each other, showing that they weren't experienced villains. Letting out a yell, Izuku lashed out every time one of the thugs got close, Hagakur picking up dropped weapons to sneak more attacks in, while the thugs were focused on him, and Mineta continued to roll on the ground and clutch a possibly broken nose. Most of the thugs went in flailing, knives and scythes cutting into Izuku's arms and torso. At least a third of the thugs got taken down by friendly fire, none of the villains caring about their comrades or being careful to not hit them. Be alright Hagakur. Izuku panted, pulling a knife from his shoulder blade with a grimace. His quirk had yet to really gain all that much adaption against cutting as of yet. FF fine. Hagakur's gloves were shaking, each fist holding a knife that was dripping red from various stabs and slashes she dealt against the thugs whenever they got close. None were fatal, but she was clearly not used to hurting anyone, especially not to the point of blood drawn. You bulk my dose you itch. Mineta screamed, clutching his bleeding face with an angry yell. Mouthy little thing, isn't he? A new voice chuckled as Izuku's head snapped over, seeing the white uniformed bunny girl step out from behind a rock, where she'd apparently been watching her colleagues throwing themselves against his bone-breaking punches or Hagakur's blades, isn't he honey? He is indeed. A villain with green armor and a skull-like mask shattered stone as he pulled himself from the ground, electricity crackling on his arms, you did well enough against the gutter trash kitties, but playtime is over. I'd recommend you put your hands up if you don't want to get fried. Come on honey, you know they're not going to listen. The bunny girl villainess giggled, little balls of pink and white flame dancing atop her fingers. I guess. The skull villain shrugged, let's just toast em then. At that, the girl threw the balls of flame their way, Mineta's wails growing louder as Izuku snarled, throwing out his arms wide as the fireballs hit him. Their flames not enough to give him more than a small burn, given how often he'd been burnt by Bakugo's nitroglycerin-like sweat over the years. Small sunburn-like blemishes marred his skin as the two remaining villains gaped, eyes wide. Huh, so you're a little tougher than expected, huh kid? The skull masked villain sounded a little excited at the prospect of a good fight, but are your friends, as the villain's statement was cut off as he moved to dodge a rock Izuku was throwing. The bunny girl villainess wasn't as fast and took his thrown rock to the gut, collapsing with a choked gasp, likely suffering some broken ribs. Okay, the skull masked thug snarled, eyes narrowing at seeing the state the woman was left in, now I'm pissed. Bring it. 
Izuku charged, gritting his teeth as the painful lightning hit him, sizzling against his skin. He landed a hit, but the burns were far worse than what the fireballs had managed to do. So, you're not as tough as you look. Skull Mask narrowed his eyes, studying him before scoffing whatever, time to die Kai RK. The villain fell to the ground, his skull helmet cracked after Hagaker used her invisibility to sneak behind and shatter the dropped club from another club over his helmet, knocking the lightning villain out. D thanks Hagaker. Izuku grunted, straightening up as he looked around, picking up a large kanabo, both to use as a cane as he caught his breath and to use in a fight, should more villains show up, now come on, we need to get back to the others. Mineta, move your ass. Azawa. Gritting his teeth to hold back a scream, not wanting his students to hear, Azawa's vision swam as the giant charcoal black monstrosity slammed his face into the concrete ground once again, bones crunching loudly from impact. His disintegrated elbow was still throbbing enough to make itself known, the exposed muscle screaming in pain, along with his shattered bones. What do you think of him Eraserhead? The psychopath covered in hands was practically panting with glee at the question, he's the bio-engineered anti-symbol of peace. But you can call him Nomu. At hearing its name, the creature let out an unnatural shrieking cry, its hands still gripping his limbs, as always undistegrated arm bent in ways no bone should ever bend. Your power racing quirks. It's annoying but nothing special. When faced against true overwhelming power, you might as well just be a quirkless child. As the bastard spoke, Nomu began twisting the already broken arm. Before the skin could shred beyond repair, Azawa's stomach dropped when he heard a familiar voice yelling in rage, get the hell away from him. Azawa, Nomu, and the psychopath all looked over to see Midoriya charging over in his transformed state, swinging a kanabo at Nomu's face, the blow hitting the villain in the teeth, but not even budging it. One of your students, huh? The psychopath chuckled as Nomu reached up, grasping the kanabo, shattering the war club in its grip, going straight for an attempt at a killing blow. How violent. Even as the psychopath spoke, Azawa grunted, trying to blink the blood from his eyes to nullify the giant monster's quirk, only managing to help Midoriya for a split moment as his student landed a punch against Nomu's face, some teeth flying out before the giant creature squeezed his arm. Broken bones crunching as Azawa finally let out a scream, his quirk fading away. As it faded, Azawa saw the flesh around Nomu's jaw writhe and bulge, new jagged teeth pushing themselves out of the monster's gums. A healing quirk and some sort of resistance quirk. Was it like Midoriya? Nomu, this brat annoys me. Get rid of him. The hand-covered psychopath waved a lazy hand as the mist-bodied villain appeared at his side, his word going unheard as Azawa's ears were ringing from all the blows to his skull. With a screech, Nomu dropped him to the ground, leaping at Midoriya and landing a heavy blow against his student's face. As he lay in a crater, the blood from his wound starting to pool, Azawa felt a pair of hands work to lift him up. HRN. Azawa struggled to try and form words as he worked to clear his eyes, unable to see anything as whatever or whoever it was lifted him out of the crater, the mighty traded blows from the two behemoths booming loud enough for even Azawa's damaged ears to hear. As he got pulled into some bushes, he saw a pair of boots and gloves put themselves on seemingly thin air. Hagaker. Trembling inside the bushes he also saw Mineta, hands clutched over his mouth while tears flowed down past an obviously broken nose. Come on, we need to get back to the others. Hagaker was trembling as he heard her turn, possibly looking back to where they'd left Midoriya, we need to help him. LB Ein. Mineta protested angrily, sending a glare at Hagaker that would warrant questioning later. Shut up. Hagaker snapped at him, all you've done was make things easier for the villains since we got here. Definitely needed to question them once he could talk, we need to get to 13, we need more teachers. Izuku can buy us some time but I don't think it will be much. Izuku. Screaming in rage, and admittedly pain from all the blows that had long since started to overcome even the resistance he'd built up, Izuku threw another punch into the gut of this Nomu guy, his fist doing nothing, the force of his blows doing nothing more than rippling the skin like gelatin. Bulging muscles shaking before settling back into rigid conformity. Shock absorption, healing, and who knew what else. If this thing really was bioengineered, then who knows what sort of tricks and abilities it had. Ooh, this is getting boring Kurajiri. The one covered in hands complained as Noma rocketed Izuku's massive grey form with another punch, the skin darkening with a nasty bruise, even if Izuku was staying on his feet through a combination of resistances and sheer stubbornness. Then intercede and be done with it. The mist man replied back, tone polite yet clipped, like he would rather scold the lead villain, but knew better or wasn't able to. Before Izuku could try to figure out what that meant, or do anything but stay on his feet in the devastating barrage of blows that felt like All Might was trying to turn him into powder, he heard the leader let out a frustrated sigh, he in. The next thing Izuku knew, the pale bastard rushed on, grabbing his arm, and the fingers began to dig in and in and in, while Nomura strained him. 
Izuku let out a cry, dropping to a knee as his right arm fell to the ground with a wet slap, blood leaking from the severed limb, and a stump it came from, while his other arm was gripped by the Nomu. So, you're just a big punching bag after all. The bastard chuckled, shaking the blood from his fingers, maybe I'll take you back with me, make a new pet. Or not, who knows. As he spoke, the villain picked up Izuku's severed arm and played with the fingers, making the limb flip Izuku the bird. Heads up. Hearing the excited voice of Kaminari, Izuku turned seeing a group of his classmates charging to try and save him. He saw Kaminari lashing out with a metal chain, lightning sparking along its length. He saw Mina, holding her hands together to funnel her acid like a geyser, a trick they discussed in one of their brainstorming sessions over the week. The Erozu, aiming and firing a cannon she'd materialized. Todoroki releasing a rushing barrage of ice spikes. All of them vanishing into swirling portal of mist before Izuku's world exploded into more pain. Aminari's chain impacted his chest, lightning surging through Izuku's body as he screamed. Eirozu's cannonball striking him at his left knee, bone splintering as his limb fell to the ground along with his taken arm. Mina's acid rained down on his remaining arm, melting it off at the shoulder. And Todoroki's spikes impaled him, his remaining foot shredding as more of them hit his guts. He saw all of them freeze with horror, he heard the one covered in hands laugh in bloodthirsty jubilation, and he felt the doors to the USJ explode inward under unrelenting force. Chapter 14. All Might. The USJ echoed from the thunderous boom of his punch caving in the giant metal doors, steel warping under his fist, and a cloud of dust billowing out into the domed building. As he strode in, fist clenching his jacket tightly, All Might saw a group of students partway down the steps, looking up at him with relief and joy. It failed to quell his burning rage, have no fear students. All Might snarled out, teeth grit together tearing off his tie as he yelled out his famous catchphrase, for I am here. He had a whole speech planned, a confident statement to unnerve the villains and reassure his students. But then he got a good look at the plaza. He saw several students with expressions of horror on their faces as they stared at a classmate. He saw that classmate mutilated beyond anything he'd seen on the job for years, the fading warp gates and remnants of the attacks, making it clear just what had done most of those wounds. He saw a massive black monstrosity, one so familiar to all for one's old projects that it made him sick, clutching one of young Midoriya's severed arms. He saw the apparent leader of this group of scum playing with Midoriya's other arm, using the removed limb to make crude gestures. All Might saw Red. Shigaraki. After all this waiting, the heroic piece of trash finally arrives. Shigaraki chuckled, playing with his new toy, I guess our little game can conti his words were cut off as he felt a rush of wind. Saw All Might vanish from where he was mixed with the sound of wrenching steel, faster than Shigaraki could process. He felt the blood covering him, the iron taste filling his mouth as All Might's thrust with a torn off light post, speared though Nomu that had taken the blow, the tip apparently pointed enough to help All Might overcome shock absorption. The hero's face itself filled Shigaraki with a fear that he hadn't felt since he was a child, seeing those dark shadowed eyes, blue eyes glowing with hatred and fury, the severed arm of the grey-skinned brat, falling to the ground from limp fingers. But the grunt, All Might swung his makeshift lance, sending the skewered Nomu flying into the lake with a violent splash. Students. All Might's voice was firm, tight with rage yet clearly directed at everyone but the heroes and their little brats get Midoriya and get back to the entrance. As the man gave his order, Shigaraki noticed that every thug between them and the steps was unconscious and thrown about, All Might's charge to try and kill him, having included scattering them like leaves in a storm. Shigaraki took a wary step back, hating himself for it, as All Might turned his attention back to him fully, going straight for a killing blow. How unheroic of you symbol of peace. You mutilated my student. All Might kept walking, the students hastily grabbing the grey-skinned brat and his severed limbs, hauling off the massive thrashing and screaming teenager, you used your quirk to rot off one of his limbs. Shigaraki felt a pit in his stomach as All Might identified his quirk without seeing it or it being mentioned. H. How? For a moment, Shigaraki wondered if he'd gotten in over his head. The decayed and corrupted flesh on Midoriya's arm and stump, the damage to his Awa's elbow. All Might gripped his fist around the lamp post in his arm, the blood-stained metal and glass top trembling, the fact you keep your pinky finger lifted and away from whatever you're doing. I've fraught scum like you for years, I know how to read the signs of my opponents. This this was the man who'd fraught his master, who had left all for one in a state that he was barely alive, even with his multitude of quirks. He wasn't ready for this. Nomu. Shigaraki's confidence cracked apart, his voice shaking as he called for the monster his master had given him, kill everyone you can. The massive black creature let out a screech as it burst from the lake, charging at All Might with a screech, the mountainous blonde having gained control over his rage after his initial attempt to impale him. 
although given the control he'd shown when he only knocked out the much weaker thugs, then Shigaraki would likely live to be pumped for whatever information they'd be able to get out of him. Nomu, the wound fully closed up now, threw an earth-shattering punch of all might, warping the light post as they fought, the creature attacking whatever was closest to it, whether that be all might, or the thugs, whenever all might got tossed away by a strong enough punch. Be supposed to be weaker. Shigaraki shook as he saw All Might trade blows with Nomu, overwhelming the creature with unrelenting fury, before letting out a powerful uppercut that actually sent the creature skyrocketing into the sky and through the ceiling. The fight having been only caught in glimpses as the two fighters moved faster than he or Kurajiri could keep track of most of the time, we need to arg. His attempt to order a retreat was cut off as bullets cut into him, the hot metal burning as they sat embedded in his limbs. The other teachers of UA had arrived, they'd seen the state of their students and co-workers, and they were just as enraged as All Might. Mist enveloped his vision as Kurajiri got them out of there. Even with the bleeding holes in his body, knowing he failed Sensei hurt more. Present Mick. Arms crossed, the voice hero worked to not scowl near the two students who were about to be questioned by Tsukauchi. Of class 1 of there were 18 still at the USJ, Iida having been left at the school once he alerted everyone of the threat, and Midoriya having been rushed to the hospital along with recovery girl to aid in the healing of him, 13, and Shota. At the thought of his badly hurt best friend, Hizashi grit his teeth, wanting to find the ones who'd done that and scream them apart. That being the reason Nezu had ordered him to stay out here with the students and himself, while the rest of the faculty went through to find and secure all the villains that got left behind. Namuri was just as angry as he was admittedly, but lacked his destructive quirk. Hearing door open, Hizashi looked over to see Tsukahuchi walk in, Nezu perking up from where he sat on Hizashi's shoulder, thank you for your patience. The man said gently to the shaking Hagakur and the scowling Mineta, I wanted to ensure the rest of your classmates were all securely with an officer before we began. Why are we the only ones being questioned in here? Mineta got out through a badly broken nose, several wet wipes littering the table all stained red, after having been used to clean off a multitude of dried blood. Before he was rushed to urgent care, your sensei as Awa requested that you two be questioned on something that was said during the USJ incident, although we aren't able to get details from him before All Might rushed him out. Tsukauchi explained, the orders being the only thing as Awa had managed to get out to the staff when they arrived before feeling safe enough to pass out. She broke my nose. Mineta pointed a finger at Hagakur who let out an angry snarl, and his ashy was sure she was glaring at the diminutive student. A glance at Tsukauchi showed the man flashing a sign for truth, the cop's lie detection quirk invaluable in times like these. You deserved it you creepy little bastard. Hagakur yelled at Mineta, his ashy having to quickly move in to separate the two. Language. Nezu scolded the girl, the little mammal's expression firm, and explained why your classmate would deserve to have his nose broken by you during a villain attack. He tried to the girl let out a disgusted shudder, the action clear, thanks to her exaggerated body language shown through her clothes, when we landed in the mountain area after that misty villain tossed us through a warp gate, Mineta started shouting about how he didn't want to die. That's a fair thing to want. Tsukahuchi said warily, all three adults well aware there had to be more. Then he started whining about how he hadn't even kissed a girl or touched a boob yet. The irate girl continued, finally, Mineta decided he refused to die without getting to grope someone and tried to jump on me and paw me while we were surrounded by villains. You endangered your classmate by trying to sexually assault her during a villain attack his ashy's voice, while not strong enough to cause damage, still rattled the windows of the little office room at the USJ they were using. You don't have proof. Mineta snapped back at the girl, Hizashi, remembering Izawa's report from earlier in the year about the kid wanting to find or make a peephole into the girl's locker room. My quirk is a lie detection ability. The detective's voice was frosty as Mineta paled, and I'm well aware she was telling the truth. Tsukauchi reached up to his collar and radioed in another officer Mineta, I'll be having you give the remainder of your statement to another officer, given what actions you were trying to do to this young lady earlier. And just to be clear, I'll be reading your statement afterwards and confirming with you that it's accurate, so I would suggest you neither lie nor embellish. Are we clear? Yes. The shaking and suddenly crying boy nodded, eyes wide with fear. A large and burly officer came and escorted Mineta away, while Tsukauchi finished, gently, interrogating the girl, her rage leaving her once Mineta was gone, as she broke down into tears at what he tried to do. And what had happened to Midoriya when the kid fought to protect his class. Fucking hell, his ashy muttered under his breath, this is a mess. And he knew the day was far from over if Nezu's angry muttering was any indication. Chapter 15. Man. I wanted to address something from the reviews for last chapter. One of the reviewers, a guest going by the name Guestinator, stated that it didn't make sense that Izuku had so many good ideas for himself but not others. That's a psychology thing and how I picture this Izuku thinking. 
he spent years being told he was worthless, he only started standing up for himself once he understood the potential of his quirk, and even then, he doesn't have the best grip of his emotions yet. But more importantly, he spent those years getting used to thinking of his quirk as useless and other quirks as amazing. He conditioned himself to think of ways to improve others but not himself. Once he has, he's been focusing on his body for now and the basics of how to fight. He went from being scrawny to ripped because he was trying to improve his basics. As for their remark about a lighter Izuku is still a teenager here. I don't know about other parts of the world, but where I grew up you couldn't buy those unless you were a legal adult, and I can't see Mamadaria leaving lighters or matches around for Izuku to train with. Izuku has emotional and mental hurdles to overcome in his growth. It's not an aspect I failed to think about, it's part of an intended character arc. A and 2. Another thing someone brought up is the pairing, stating that there were others who would be a better fit than Yanagi. Now I already messaged them, stating that I had a bit of a slower burn planned in the beginning and that there would be catalysts to advance things, but it got me thinking. Of those that Twilight Blazak Knight mentioned as better candidates, all but Hagakur already have chosen pairings planned out. Hagakur hadn't and it got me thinking. I'm still planning on doing Yanagi as a pairing but, as I've shown in several other stories, I'm not one to stick desperately to the original idea if the story naturally develops in another direction. So please give me your genuine review on the matter whether Hagakur, or Yanagi, or someone else. I write on here to improve my ability to write so constructive feedback is something I genuinely love seeing. So, thanks again the Twilight Blazak Knight for your in-depth review. A and 3. Sorry everyone, I wanted to have this out days ago, but work has been murder recently. I work in the insurance field, and after Hurricane Ida came through I haven't had a moment to breath well on the clock. Chapter 15. Aminari. Teeth grit and eyes blazing with determination, Kaminari held out both of his hands as he sat alone in his room. Ever since the police had returned him home, the school notifying everyone that classes were cancelled for the rest of the week to resume Monday, Kaminari had only left to eat and use the restroom. All of his attention during every waking moment absorbed by the task he had set himself to. Come on. Kaminari ground out, his left hand sparking and dancing with the electricity of his quirk, while his right hand trembled as he struggled to do something he'd never tried before. You're my power so obey me damn it. After a few more moments, Kaminari let out the breath he didn't realize he was holding, his power fading away at yet another failed attempt to be able to absorb electricity, specifically his own. There has to be something I'm missing. Kaminari's leg bounced, his entire body filled with restless energy as he once again started looking through the internet for anything about how regular electricity or the few tips other electricity quirk users would post online. Due to a fear of villains and using any quirk training advice online it was hard to find, most if any quirk training only being done in person by other people, which made his situation all that much harder. Leaning back in his desk chair with a sigh, Kaminari took a sniff before wincing, deciding that he probably should at least add showering to the things he did besides training before classes resumed. The smell was probably just making concentration harder anyway. When he finally went down to dinner, hair still damp from the shower, he saw the relief on his parents' faces. Had him working as hard it really worried them that much. Hey, sweetie. His mom smiled, setting a plate for him at the table as he sat down, still training. I have to. Kaminari's knuckles turned white as he gripped his fork, I after the USJ I can't not again. As much as he'd been studying more the past few days, he still wasn't the best at putting his intent into words at times. Well, your mother and I saw how seriously you've been taking this oh. His father gave him a proud nod, and I managed to get something for you. I spoke to the police who looked into the incident, and from the reports this was yours right. His father pulled up a bag and set the aluminum chain from the USJ on the table by Kaminari's spot. Seeing his reflection in the gleaming metal, the police having apparently cleaned it before returning it to his father, Kaminari trembled. He smelt Midoriya's burning flesh again. He heard the screams of pain from both Midoriya and the villains. Saw the flashes of blinding light form his quirk being unleashed. Get that thing away from me. Kaminari lashed out, sending the chain flying from the table as he fell from his chair, scrambling back against the wall, eyes wide and breath shaking. His parents rushed over, trying to comfort him as he shook with shallow frantic breaths, reliving the USJ again, reliving his failures again. He didn't need that chain, he didn't need more ways to cause pain, didn't need to make his quirk stronger. What he needed more than anything else was control. Eirozu. Fingers steepled, Yeirozu poured over her records of what had transpired at the USJ, over the models of the event she'd made. Simulation after simulation, idea after idea, all trying to figure out how she could have possibly done better. How she could have helped without without Midoriya getting. Taking a forceful bite of food, Yeirozu forced it down, along with the feelings that she might not be good enough for the UA hero track. 
What help had she really been at the USJ? In the lake all she had done was make a chain. Aminari was the one who'd actually used it, had figured out how much power to put through and subdue the horde of villains that had aimed to kill them. Asui had saved her and Kaminari from the initial fall in the lake and then gotten them to shore. She was the class president. She was supposed to protect her classmates, to lead them. Miss Yerozu. The anxious voice of a maid called out as they brought another meal to her, her room littered with various items she created using her quirk, frantically working to improve the speed and complexity of her creations, I brought your food. Are you sure you don't need rest young miss? I don't need rest. Yerozu forced down the food as the prismatic glow shone from her skin once again, I need to get better. I can't be useless again. She had a responsibility to her class and a debt to repay to Midoriya for what she had done, no matter what it took to repay. Mina. Breathing hard, Mina ran through the USJ, tears running down her face as she went. She passed blood, broken stone, shattered tree and glass. All around she could hear the terrified screams of her classmates and teachers, but couldn't find any of them, only the villains here to kill everyone. Said villains would swipe and paw at her whenever she came close, driving and corling her towards the plaza central, where she could see the villain covered in severed hands, sitting on his always mangled but still living body, while the giant black monstrosity continued to rain blow after blow upon. A staggering Midoriya. No. Mina screamed, seeing the only classmate she'd managed to come across being beaten down, no. She ran, desperate to help, no. Acid surged from her in quantities she'd never before achieved, rocketing like a geyser from her arms, legs, and torso at the giant black beast. None of it made it. The black misty portal appeared in the way, sucking up her acid as numerous gates opened throughout the USJ, acid rain falling down over everyone but herself, the mist villain, the hand villain, and the black beast. She heard the screams of agony from her friends, her teachers, and even the villains. She saw Midoriya, one of her best friends, melting before her eyes, Mina's acid eating away at his body as she was forced to watch, unable to stop the acid from rushing out, her body growing weaker and weaker as the torrent continued. All while that fucking hand-covered villain laughed like a psychopath. And then she awoke. Screams echoed throughout her bedroom, it took a few moments for Mina to realize the screams were her own, as lights blared to life throughout the house and those nearby. Mina. Her father burst through the door, eyes so much like her own white and frantic what's wrong. Shaking, Mina clutched onto her father, sobbing as the memory of the nightmare, only the latest of many, replayed through her mind. In the doorway she saw her mother observe them in concern before moving to go calm any frantic neighbors awoken by her terrified screaming. Endeavor. Rubbing the back of his neck, Endeavor entered his home after another long day of patrols, his body barely through the front door when his elder surviving son, Natsuo, grabbing the front of his hero uniform snarling, are you fucking happy you bastard? His son, one he knew despised him, shouted with eyes wide and full of angry tears, so desperate to make Shoto use his fire, you make him terrified of mom's ice. What are you talking about? Endeavor demanded, eyes boring into his elder son's, while Fayumi wrung her hands nervously. Thinking about recent events, Endeavor deduced what the likely situation was and removed Natsuo's hands, where is Shoto? The training room. Fayumi gulped nervously as Endeavor strode past her and her brother, Natsuo still glaring angrily. Heading to the dojo, Endeavor saw his son backed against the wall and shaking, very few pieces of ice in the room, and ones far sloppier than he knew his youngest was capable of creating. Here to gloat. Shoto panted, frost scaling up and down his son's right side. What happened? Endeavor didn't rise to the bait, falling into a routine that, while familiar to him, would be unfamiliar to any of his children, walk me through the event. What do you care? Shoto looked confused but quickly snapped back to his usual vitriol. You're afraid of your own power Shoto, and that's dangerous, both for you and everyone around you. Endeavor's tone was firm, broking no argument, now tell me what happened. Shoto looked suspicious but relented, likely as there was no mention of flame anywhere at the USJ. I used my ice to subdue the villains in the area I first landed in without issue. When I went to the plaza, I saw a classmate fighting the largest of the thugs and was losing ground. I, I sent ice spikes to impale parts of the villain and slow it down, but a portal appeared in their way, the spikes hitting my classmate, along with attacks from others in 1A. Shoto shook, looking close to throwing up, my spikes impaled him, shredded off one of his feet and ankles, and perforated his torso. I saw blood so much blood. And now whenever you use your eyes, you see that event again, saw what you did to a comrade. Endeavor rose up, observing his son intently before continuing, do you wish to be removed from the hero track? W what Shoto reeled back before narrowing his eyes in suspicion, what about your great creation? You've been pushing me to be a hero since I can remember. You stated you wished to be a hero. Endeavor stared him back dead in the eye, so I trained you as you never stated that was no longer the case. 
Natsuo and Fayumi did not wish to be heroes, so I did not train them. Toyotoya wished to be a hero, but I begged him to take another path. Endeavor forced back the memories of his eldest child's death, you may complain at my training methods, but at least I gave you and your siblings a choice, mine didn't. What? Shoto blinked confused as Endeavor realized he'd never really discussed his family history with any of his children. Our ancestor was one of the first professional heroes of Japan Shoto, our line being the first to ever show a fire quirk. Endeavor realized he was giving the same lecture, near word for word, that his father had given to him as a boy, our family have had prominent heroes in the service of Japan ever since, always high-ranking members of Japan's defenders. You said you had siblings. Shoto frowned, likely at the fact that the boy had never met any relatives outside of those who lived in this house at some point. Had siblings. Endeavor's fire bears flickered out for a moment before he regained control of himself, I was the youngest of seven. Four died before reaching the age to attend UA, and one died in their second year during their work study. And the last. Shoto studied him, the boy possibly looking for any signs of dishonesty. Was born quirkless and my parents threw him out into the streets the moment he was of age. He was found dead a week later. Endeavor clenched his fist as he remembered his favorite elder brother, they gave none of us a choice which killed my siblings. I would not do the same. So, I trained you as you said you wished to be a hero. If that is no longer the case, then I will pull you out. I will be a hero. Shoto snarled, eyes blazing with defiance. Then get up, it's time to train. Endeavor melted the ice already in the room easily. I won't use my flames. Shoto showed he still was more than a little defiant. We're training your ice. Endeavor looked Shoto in the eye, that is the issue right now. You fear causing injury or death when you don't intend to. So, you must improve your ability to restrain and detain without any injury dealt. He raised his body temperature, fire your ice at me, restrain me even through my heat cloak. Or is your statement that you'll be a hero all talk? Shoto's response was a rapid rush of ice hurtling at Endeavor, melting upon contact with his skin. Keep going Shoto. Endeavor didn't even bat an eye as another wave came, Shoto seeming much more determined with him as a target. He'd helped dozens upon dozens of sidekicks through this same issue that near every pro hero went through at some point, he just hadn't expected to have to help his own child with it so soon. Azawa. Standing in front of his class, covered in bandages but mostly mobile, Azawa looked around at the 19th students already here. He could see bags under eyes from lack of sleep. He could see they were somewhat thinner from fewer meals. He could see trauma, fear, rage, and determination. Although in the case of one purple-haired student it was more desperation. The thought filled him with displeasure as he remembered the reports that the police had taken from the incident about Mineta's actions. Azawa had been prepared to expel him on the spot, but had been overruled by the Hero Commission of all people. The commission stated that the traumatic experience of the USJ made it extenuating circumstances and that Mineta was to be given another chance, that they didn't want to throw away a potential pro-hero whose quirk was perfect for restraining villains without worry of high-cost collateral damage. So, they'd been forced to give Mineta an ultimatum. That he must both impress them and show he deserved to be in the hero track by the end of the sports festival if he wished to remain. Whether the boy figured the meaning of made the same mistakes most everyone who'd gotten that ultimatum did was not of any consequences to him. He was just about to begin, regardless of Midoriya's lack of presence, when the door slid open. Sorry I'm late sir, train got delayed and my phone was destroyed at the USJ, haven't had a chance to get a new one yet. Stepping through he saw Midoriya looking fresh-faced and whole. No bags under his eyes, no gaunt features from lack of food, no shaken fear from the incident. Midori. Mina rushed, grasping him with wide-eyed desperation as she felt and saw all four limbs were perfect there and whole eye but my acid how. The others from the incident, as well as young Kirishima and Yuraka, were rushing to the boy as well and just as confused. I told you, I heal. Midoriya smiled, with recovery girl's help it didn't even take the full 24 hours like I expected. Mina started sobbing as she clutched Midoriya's shirt, babbling out apology after apology for her quirk hurting him like it had. Midoriya's response chilled Azawa to the bone, it's no big deal Amina, you didn't mean to him me. Midoriya smiled with warm forgiveness at his friends and classmates at that, showing little care for himself, for his health, or potentially even his life. Easy forgiveness and signs that the boy wasn't crippled would likely help in the mental recovery of his classmates, but now Azawa had a bigger concern. Midoriya's mental state was not healthy and he wasn't sure how to fix it. Chapter 16. Man. I just don't get some of the reviewers I had last chapter in regard to Mineta. Wasn't that bad in canon. Mineta flat out cried about dying before getting to touch a boob in the show. He admits he wants to be a hero, so girls would want him to grope them. Even during the tense situation, he found time to mess with and comment on Asui's chest. 
As for the person asking why Mina was allowed to be a pervert and Mineta wasn't, please take a minute to think about this. One person playfully flirting with their friends and calling them eye candy isn't the same thing as carving peepholes into the other gender's changing room or trying to forcefully grope someone. One is playful banter so long as the one being bantered with isn't uncomfortable, the other is straight sexual harassment and illegal. Chapter 16. Bakugo. Confident smirk in place, Bakugo walked through the halls of UA on the way to his class, not letting his expression change as he processed all the rumors and details he'd learned off the Class 1 USJ incident in his head. Class 1 had gotten to go to the advanced training section before he had. Villains had attacked the USJ with Class 1 in it. The student of Class 1 had been seriously injured. The student of Class 1 was facing potential expulsion for unheroic acts during the USJ and would be if they failed to prove themselves at the sports festival that was happening in a month. The first two factors had been something nobody could predict. Villains were insane and stupid by definition, so nobody could have expected them to attack the hero of UA, especially when All Might had started working here. Will Class 1 at being prioritized over 1B over him had been too absurd to consider before it happened. The other two factors though made perfect sense. Of course, someone from Wana got hurt, and someone from Wana was facing being thrown from the hero track, that class had Deku in it. The useless fuck probably tried running away from a fight, drew the attention of the villains, and got hurt in the process. Fully confident of his conclusion, Bakugo focused more on sneering at the stupid trio walking his way and not getting out of the way. The shaking and cowardly looking elf motherfucker. The blonde guy doing a bad fusion cosplay of Tin Tin and the fallout guy. And some blue-haired airheaded bimbo. Whoever they were, they'd best wise up and get out of his way now. Azawa. Rubbing his face, Azawa sat in his office, feeling far older than he really was as he thought back to the lesson yesterday. He'd taken Izuku aside, tried to get a feel for the boy's mental state, and did not like the end result. The boy genuinely failed to see any issue with what happened, didn't seem to think it mattered about how badly he'd gotten hurt. The knock at the door roused him from his thoughts, come in. He quickly put up his hard-ass teacher voice as UA's big three entered, two grinning like loons, while the last hid behind his bolder companions. Hello, Eraserhead sir. Tagata waved happily, sorry we're late, ran into an angry first year who wanted to fight for some reason. He was so adorably cranky. Hadu giggled, bouncing up and down as she clapped, like a little Pomeranian. That would be Bakugo. Azawa sighed, slumped and letting his exhaustion show as the three third years got on edge, knowing this was serious if he called for them and was letting them see him look like this. What did you do with him? His homeroom teacher came to collect him sir, why are we here? Tagata studied him intently, the boy far smarter than most gave him credit for given his usual demeanor and appearance. I need your help with one of my first years. Azawa brought out a basic file on Midoriya on the surface you'll just be his training partners if you three agree. Training partners. Najira blinked confused while Amajiki took the file to read, why can't he train with his classmates? They're too afraid to fight him after the USJ. Azawa saw the recognition flare up in their eyes, yes, he's the student who got injured. He still wasn't sure who let the information about that Ermineta situation out, at this point just thankful that the names never got released. If he's injured, should you even be letting him train right now? Amajiki asked shakily, going through the page about Midoriya's personality and how it would switch. He has a healing factor and is already back to full health. The issue is that one of the villains had a warping quirk and used it to redirect several attacks from his classmates at Midoriya. Nearly everyone in that class saw the result even if they didn't launch an attack itself, and right now, they're having a hard time fighting him without flashbacks. It'll get better over time, but it's not fair to Midoriya to have nobody to train with when his first sports festival is approaching. That's not all, is it? Tagada's expression was serious, no goofiness to be seen anymore. He has no real value for his own life. While I'm glad he didn't hold a grudge against his classmates for what happened he wasn't even bothered by it. As Awa hoped the three would understand his position, he brushed off what happened with a simple they didn't mean to hit me. He's reckless, impulsive, and has no care for his own health, which is only going to get worse now that he knows he can lose entire limbs and be fine a day later. I was hoping you three could help him. Why us? Najira tilted her head the other way as Amajiki kept hiding behind the file, Azawa wasn't even sure if he was really reading it at this point, wouldn't a second year be a better person to train against a firstie than will us? Because of Mirio went through, and how you both helped him. As Azawa spoke, Mirio's eyes flashed with understanding, when you first started getting a grasp on your quirk, I remember how reckless you became. How you threw yourself into any situation as you felt invincible without a care in the world. 
Midoriya yes, his quirk could one day make that status a reality for himself, but he's not there yet, and if he keeps up this habit of running headfirst into any fight, relying solely on his quirk. Then one day he's going to meet a threat he hasn't built up resistance to, and he'll get killed. He only survived the USJ as All Might showed up right after he was maimed. Had All Might been even a minute later, the villain leading the attack would have probably killed him. He isn't seeing Hound Dog. Tagata frowned as he took the file from Amajiki who let out an eep and hid behind his hands. He is but he doesn't see anything wrong with himself. Azawa shook his head, so he's been stubborn whenever I did manage to get him into that office. No, he'd respond better to a friend, especially if they went through similar personality phases. Now, will you help my student? All might. So, what's this meeting all about? Grant Torino grumbled as they got settled in Nezu's office, along with Sir Night Eye and Recovery Girl, I wanted to find a place to observe Night Eye's lecture today. It's about my list of candidates, about the whole plan to pass one for all onto a new symbol of peace. All Might let out a tired sigh as he ran a hand down his face, after the USJ well I started thinking, and there are two points I wish to bring up today. This sounds serious. Nezu hummed thoughtfully before letting out a little smile, I'll make some tea. Tuning out the quirked chimera, who honestly never gave up any excuse for tea, All Might steepled his bony fingers and looked at the others in the room, everyone but Detective Tsukauchi, who knew his secret currently sitting around him first, I'd like to bring Azawa in on this secret. Vlad King as well if you think he's ready for it. He didn't know the blood hero as well as the erasure hero, which is why he was leaving that decision to Nezu and Recovery Girl. You want their opinion since they're the ones with the most exposure to the students. Recovery Girl nodded thoughtfully, it does make sense, and Azawa is a splendid hero. Glad well he can get more than a little competitive, but he'd never put his personal goal to outdo Azawa ahead of the student's health or future. While I'm opposed to the idea of more people knowing about one for all than is necessary, I can see the logic of this. Night Eye pushed his glasses up before furrowing his brows, but you said that there were two factors, I'm guessing the other is more complicated. I'm wondering if a symbol of peace is a good idea anymore. All Might sighed, raising a hand to stop the sudden protests he knew would be coming from his old sidekick, I know it was needed when I first stepped onto the scene, but I'm wondering if it's what's best now. The USJ that attack happened because they were after me, after the symbol of peace. Because if a society is held up by a singular pillar, it just means there's one thing to remove to let the whole thing come crumbling down. The other heroes just don't have enough drive nowadays. Just look at the top five heroes, there's myself, who is the sole pillar. Hawks who doesn't even want to be as high ranked as he does, I don't even think he wants to be a hero some days. Best Genist and Edshot are comfortable with their place and don't seem driven to climb higher up the ranks. Endeavor is one of the only heroes out there who seems genuinely determined to surpass me in ability. And while he respected Endeavor, he knew full well the man had his own issues that wouldn't lead to being a stable symbol of peace, at least not at the moment. So, what, you're suggesting you just hold on to the quirk and let it fade away from history? Sir Knight I looked affronted at the very notion. No. All Might shook his head, my secondary plan is that we announce my imminent retirement. Maybe bring up some health issues that went unnoticed until now, that I wish to focus on training the next generation of heroes with the time I have left. This will hopefully light a fire under the other heroes to make them start picking up the slack, to start pushing themselves. As for my quirk, it should be kept secret and who's better at secrets, he slapped a file with a distinctive UA teacher's face on it, than an underground hero. Chapter 17. Man. Gonna start doing those guest lectures like Sir Night Eye in the story soon, so let me know if you all would like to actually see the lectures themselves shown in the story or just mentioned. And if you do want to actually see the lectures let me know what speakers and topics you all would like to see. Izuku. Crowning to himself, Izuku finally found the training facility that Izawa had told him to go to. His classmates had all been struggling to fight him ever since the USJ, their faces becoming filled with fear the moment they closed in, even Mina and Kirishima had that response. It was one of the few things he'd been willing to go to Hound Dog about, trying to figure out why his classmates and friends, as most of one had become much more open with him recently, would react like that. Hound Dog had been pretty understanding and explained it to him. That they weren't afraid of him, but for him. That the USJ was still too fresh in their minds so whenever they sparred, they saw him injured again. The faculty had assured him that it would get better with time, and while his friends trained and got over that, he'd be training with some upper years or doing solo training during his hero course periods in the afternoons until the sports festival. Shaking himself from his thoughts, Izuku opened the door and had his vision immediately filled with periwinkle blue. Ooh, you're here. The excited voice coming from the blue cheered as they flitted about him, hair tickling his nose as it swayed from their speed Mirio, he's all muscly like you are. Are you related? Wait, his hair is green, is he related to Sir Night Eye? 
Wait, what's your name again? Do you have a hero name yet? What's your quirk called? Who's your favorite hero? Do you have your own bestie group like I have my best besties? Do you know the angry Pomeranian in class 1B? Do you like pizza? I want pizza. Linking, his brain working to keep up with the rapid barrage of questions, Izuku reflexively started answering, his own motor mouth muttering being all the training he'd ever need to keep up with this girl's blabber yes, I'm here. I'm not related to anyone named Mirio. I'm pretty sure I'm not related to any pro heroes, let alone one who served as All Might's sidekick. My name is Izuku Midoriya. I don't have a hero name yet. My quirk is called Adaptation. My favorite heroes are the Water Hose duo. I have some really good friends in 1A and 1B. That sounds like Bakugo. His face darkened for a moment at stating that name before he finished up, and yes, pizza is amazing. As he finished, he noticed three different expressions of varying shock on his upperclassmen's faces, what? You answered all her questions. A massively buff blonde guy who might be related to All Might gaped. In order. A dark-haired guy with elf ears looked stunned as well as he trembled. My gremlin now. The blue-haired girl who'd rapidly questioned him picked him up and started flying away mine. Run away. The gyre, we need to train him. The blonde guy gave chase. But mine. The blue-haired girl continued to hold him like a teddy bear, as Izuku looked at the guys on the ground for support or sanity, either one would be helpful at this point. But we need to get Yayu. The blonde guy, Mirio if he remembered correctly, tapped his foot on the ground as the girl holding him up descended. I'll be good. She huffed as the blonde apparent leader smirked. Very good have a cookie. The man pulled a treat from his backpack as the girl let out a happy squee and started knowing on it with all the grace of a preschooler. Ooh, Izuku looked between the three bizarre people he was alone with and wondered if he should make a break for it. Hey, sorry about here. The blonde guy gives him an easygoing grin, I'm Mirio Tagata, that's Najire Hado, and the guy trying to become one with the corner is Tamaki Amajiki. Azawa asked us to help you train given the current situation with your class. Thanks. Pushing aside his worry nerves, Izuku shook the massive guy's hands before Hado grabbed Amajiki and drug him out of the corner. Alright, so we'll be helping you train your quirk and your body for the sports festival yes, but I want to train your mind as well. Mirio smiled, the three of us are ranked as the three strongest students currently at UA, so we can help you a lot. Before we get to physical training though I'd like to do a little exercise to get into a good mindset and get to know each other. We'll go around in a circle, introduce ourselves, state how our quirks work and something important to ourselves. Then we'll have to both try to think of something new or interesting the others could try with their quirk, and we each get one question to ask each other. Sounds easy enough. Izuku allowed the blue-haired Hado to lead them onto the training mats, the four of them sitting in a circle, Tagata's container of cookies placed in the middle for anyone wanting a snack. I'll start. Tagata offered, as I said earlier, I'm Mirio Tagata, and my quirk is known as permeation. It lets me pass through any tangible matter, but this includes light, air, and sound, so I can't see, hear, or breathe if those parts of my body are permeable when I use it. And if I turn solid again while in something else solid, I'm repelled outward. Something important to me is that I feel comedy is important to a pro hero, as it's a great skill to get rid of stress and put scared civilians at ease. Yay. Hado clapped, her cheeks stuffed out like a chipmunk as about half the cookies were already gone. Swallowing loudly, the girl grinned, I'll go first with the question and the idea. Have you asked out Yai yet? No Najire. Mirio rolled his eyes. But you two would be so cute together. Najire flailed spastulkily with a huff before she pondered, and I don't remember, have you tried making other people permeable? Tried it, and I can only make myself permeable as every bit of clothing, but my hero suit can confirm. Tagata didn't even bat an eye before turning to Amajiki. I we still getting Raymond later? The boy seemingly copped out, but given how afraid of everything he seemed to be Izuku didn't protest, Tagata merely nodding, and have you tried going solid, while your hand or finger was in a lock to jolt it into unlocking? I actually haven't. Tagata wrote it down on a notepad before all three turned to Izuku. For your quirk, can you go the opposite direction of permeation? Make your body harder to add durability for harder punches. He offered his quirk idea first, the idea being something he was more comfortable to help any nerves from rising up, now that his brain was starting to finish catching up after Hurricane Hado had blown through. That's a brilliant idea. Tagata gave him an All Might-esque smile and a thumbs up, eagerly writing it down, I'll definitely be trying that while we spar. Oh, goody. And as for my question. Izuku's expression turned serious, why did Azawa ask the three top third years to spar with me, rather than any random second year? Wow, right to the serious stuff huh? Tagata didn't seem offended or surprised by the question, and there are two factors. 
The first is that I'm the best one to help you with fighting, as my fighting style is all about assessing factors and attacking, not bothering to dodge your block attacks, since my quirk won't let me get hit when it's active. While yours doesn't work the same from what little he explained, getting basic training from me would probably help. That made sense, and they came along because where one of us goes, we all go. We'll probably even drag our friend Yayu over some days too. I guess I can go next then. Izuku accepted the reasonings given as they actually made sense, I'm Izuku Midoriya. My quirk is called Adaptation, it's a transformation quirk that lets me develop resistances to various types of damage or threats. The more I'm exposed to them the more I can resist. It also comes with a healing factor so I can heal from anything that hasn't killed me within 24 hours, although the healing factor is the only part that's active even when I'm not transformed, I have to change to resist anything. Ooh. My turn to ask. Hato leaned in eagerly, once again munching on a cookie, have you found a crush in your class yet? She loves romance stories. Togata offers while well, Izuku stammered and blushed. And then no. Izuku shook his head, flustered at the thought of even holding hands with a girl. Puo. Hato puffed out her cheeks before she considered his quirk, if you went hungry or without water for a while, would your transformed state not have to eat or drink anymore? I've never actually tested or considered that. Izuku considered the prospect while Tagata coughed his throat nervously. Midoriya please don't ever try that without the approval and supervision of a medical professional like Recovery Girl please. The blonde man begged as Izuku reluctantly nodded, figuring the times that kind of resistance would be useful wouldn't be that often. Why are the water hose heroes your favorites? Amajiki stammered out shakily but still looked curious. Yeah, I guess most people would say one of the top 10. Izuku chuckled, and to be fair before last year I would have said All Might but then I met the Water Hose duo when they saved my life. They were some of the first ones to ever believe in me, to encourage me. To tell me I could be a hero. It was one of the best memories of his life, and one of the most terrifying as it happened not long after he thought he was going to die. Can you do partial transformations? Amajiki tilted his head as Izuku froze at that question. He knew such a thing was possible. Hell, he saw his hardening friends choose how much to transform every time they used their quirks, so why had he never tried to do so himself? Guess not. Tagata gave his shoulder a friendly bump, but hey, that's why it's good to work with other people. You can bounce ideas off those with other perspectives and get a closer look at the whole picture. So, my quirk question was if you'd figured out how to properly use your untransformed state in fighting yet. Eh. Izuku blinked confused, what the hell did Tagata mean? His untransformed state was strong sure, but nothing compared to his transformed state, so why wouldn't he stay transformed in a fight if he could? You'll figure it out. Tagata promised with a mischievous gleam in his eye, as for my question, how do you know that the Kugo kid? He's someone I grew up around. Izuku's expression darkened as he remembered every curse, every jeer, the burning pain of nitroglycerin igniting against his skin, and the horrible smell that would follow. So lost on those memories, of a status that the water hose duo helped him accept, were neither friendly nor normal, he didn't notice the serious look passed between the three older students. Yanagi. Breathing hard, Yanagi ran through the halls, dodging around everyone in her way, even leaping up into the air with the aid of her quirk at times. She didn't care whenever someone got angry at her for running past them. She didn't care about how some of her classmates had reacted when she bolted from their classroom the moment the school day ended, Tetsutetsu and Tokaj hot on her heels. She didn't care that she hadn't stopped going at full sprint from the moment she started moving. All she cared about was what Kirishima had texted her. She knew Midoriya had been hurt at the USJ, Kirishima filling her and the others in. She knew Midoriya hadn't responded to any of her messages since, now explained from her one of friends that his phone got destroyed in the attack. She hadn't been able to see him yesterday as her class had run long, while his mother had him head straight home after his first day back to classes. Now she knew what room he was training in, and nothing would stop her from making sure he was alright. Heading to the training room her one of friends said Midoriya had been sent to, Ryaiko slid to a stop, seeing Midoriya fighting a blue-haired third year, who kept hitting him with energy blasts that he was too big to dodge. And she doubted he'd ever been exposed to before to build up a resistance against. Then she saw the bright gleam she loved seeing in his eyes, the cogs of his mind whirring as he leapt towards another blast, shrinking down in mid-air as the blast missed him. Hardway through the punch he threw at the stunned blue net he turned back into his massive grey form, nailing his opponent dead on as the girl got sent flying. Midoriya. She breathed, her friend looking up and over in surprise, their eyes meeting for a split second before she rocketed forward, moving faster than she ever had before, as she hugged him tight, reassuring herself that he was here and alright. Huh, I guess classes are over. 
A blonde third year noted as he held the brunette back, the girl writhing and wriggling in his grip, a massive hand covering her mouth, even as she tried to rapidly talk through it, guess we lost track of time. You one of Midoriya's friends. One of the best. Midoriya nodded as Riaiko turned bright red at the remark. Yanagi. Turning to the door she saw a heavily panting Tetsu Tetsu and Tokage, remembering she'd left them behind please don't run that fast. The metal quirk panted, having never been one for speed. How were you running on the walls like that? Tokage was less winded but still had to work to get here as fast as they did. What? She was so confused she found her sentences cut short for once as she looked at her friends confused. Yanagi, you were doing parkour running on the walls and shit. I think you flew at one point. Tetsu Tetsu wheezed. Blushing at the realization of just how desperate her mad dash had been, Riaiko tried to poise herself, I wish to ascertain with my own eyes the current health and safety of Midoriya. While I had no desire to injure anyone in my determination to determine such, I was not willing to allow them to hinder my pace either. It would seem in my determination I found new uses for my quirk that I had not tried nor considered before. It shall be something interesting to study further when I have more time to myself to fully ascertain its advantages. Although she saw listening had the vacant eyes swimming expressions, she was used to people having when she spoke for the first time, Midoriya just held her close, hugging her back as she felt how warm he was. The blue net noticed this too, and seemed to squee behind her classmate's hand as she wriggled around excitedly for some reason. Natsuo. Scowling into his coffee, Natsuo thought back to the other day at the house, of how the bastard himself had tried acting all understanding towards Shoto. He couldn't stomach it, mainly because of how genuine it all felt. Hey Natsuo. Looking up, he saw Fayumi smiling as she sat in the booth across from him, this little cafe being their place to meet up and talk where dear old dad couldn't listen in. Hey. He grunted, taking a deep pull from his hot coffee. You okay? His sister looked concerned at his dark scowl. Remembering that bastard's little act from the other day. Natsuo grit out, having spent the days since at a friend's dorm to get some space. I don't think it was an act. Fayumi winced, reaching into her bag to pull out a binder. I did some digging after we listened in between him and Shoto. She pulled out some news articles about the births and then deaths of all of their aunts and uncles. Each and every one of them, apart from their quirkless uncle who was found with distinct looking burns on his corpse, had died from their own quirks overheating and killing them. Even their grandparents had apparently died from the same thing when Endeavor had been in his final year at UA. The final thing brought out was a photo of their dad and his family when he was younger. Each and every one of his siblings had a tense expression he recognized all too well, and several bruises, scrapes, and burns on their person. W well he still made up that shit about Toya. Natsuo grit his teeth, remembering his beloved older brother, remembering Toya's rage against Endeavor, blaming the man for so much. Remembered the fire where Toya died. Natsuo that wasn't a lie. Fayumi looked down sadly, I remember back when that happened. Toya wanted to be a hero like all his classmates, but his quirk kept hurting him. Mom and dad explained to me that he had mom's resistance to ice, rather than dad's resistance to fire, and he had a slightly weaker version of the same sickness mom had to get treatment for, but was too young to get treated yet. It it was the only time I ever saw him beg. Toya begged him to be able to still be a hero, and he still tossed him aside. Natsuo grit his teeth. Natsuo dad was the one begging Toya to stop. He was on his knees and pleading for Toya to find a new passion that wouldn't risk killing him. You were really young, and Shoto was just a baby but I don't think I can ever forget that day. And. The Amic Bellow was an idea I'd originally considered using for this story before deciding to scrap it. Thought I'd share it with y'all anyway. Amic. All Might. It's been a long journey young Monoma. All Might let out a booming belly laugh as the blonde hero in training straightened up, improved physique dripping with sweat, as the boy was finally at a level where he could safely receive one for all, but at last you are ready. You have grown so much in mind and body, he'd been so proud to see the boy start to move past his grudge against Wana, but let none ever say you haven't earned this. Reaching up, he plucked a hair from his head, holding it out eat this, and the sacred torch of one for all shall be passed unto you. At last. Monoma grinned with wide-eyed excitement as he took the hair and swallowed it, along with a pill developed by Recovery Girl, to speed up digestion and allow the quirk to transfer smoother. I feel it. Monoma breathed out before letting out another of his enthusiastic laughs that kept going. And for every moment that laugh, something started to feel more and more wrong to All Might. When the familiar warp gate of Kurajiri appeared and Monoma looked unsurprised, All Might knew he'd been tricked. I can't believe that ploy actually worked. Kurajiri scoffed, sneering at All Might thank you for the quirk, oh mighty symbol of peace. The shadow figure gave a mocking bow as Monoma walked through the portal, All Might's body too weak to fight, especially now that he lacked his quirk. 
Over the next few weeks, he saw that every theory he'd had about how one for all would affect Monoma's quirk had been correct. The quirks the boy copied were stronger than those of the original. The quirks he copied never went away. There was no longer a limit to how many quirks he could hold. Unfortunately, All for One had made those predictions as well. And? So yeah, original idea was going to have Monoma as the traitor who pretends to clean up his act to get All Might's eye and be given one for all to be a villain that could also continuously grow and ensure Izuku would always have dangerous threats. I decided a different route for evil force threats, so this idea is not going to be canon to this fic. Thought I'd share it anyway. Chapter 18. And? Hey everybody, this isn't part of the usual update cycle that's put on pause for the next week. I went through all my stories, and I've deleted several of them, most being ones I adopted early on in my writing career on this website. I got rid of them as I found I had no plan and, more importantly, no spark of inspiration for them. So, I've decided to add a second chapter to my Hero Academia fic. On my profile you'll find a poll for the candidates on who to pair Izuku with in that next story. I'll put together a list of story options after a pairing is decided, this one being made in mind with that pairing, so there won't be the kind of debate this story has. A and 2. To address a concern that was raised last chapter about it being too rushed with Izuku hugging Yanagi back, but not his friends like Mina or Kirishima, I want to clarify he did hug them back during that scene with them all together, I just hadn't realized I didn't actually put that down. It will be something I go back to fix later. What doesn't kill me? Azawa. Alright, so what do you three think of him? Azawa leaned back, steepling his fingers as the big three stood across from them, the trio having come in early to share their thoughts about the previous day's first session's training with Midoriya. He's very intuitive. Tagata answered instantly, not to mention smart. He was able to keep up with one of Najire's full-speed question rants and answered each one in order within moments of having met her for the first time. Then during our getting to know each other exercise, the one you had us do with the visiting schools last year, he came up with new ideas for all of our quirks. What ideas? Azawa was curious what the self-described quirk nerd could come up with. If he kept showing suitable talent for that field, it would be enough of an excuse to warrant Azawa, bringing in some extra help to mentor him and be a stabilizing force if needed. He was already having to look into good mentors for his other problem children, so getting one handled early would just give him more time to nap later. For me it was to reverse permeation on my fists and feet as I strike, to harden them to add more force to my blows. Tagata declared happily, it works too dot 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 most. But the time anyway, I'm still getting used to it and the timing, so I can only manage it the way I want two times out of ten if I'm lucky. Ooh oh. Ooh. Me next. Hato bounced up and down eagerly, for me he suggested working on adjusting the size and rotation speed of my energy waves to make them function as a drill. Damn the problem child, you had to give her more ways to destroy things. Azawa groaned, ignoring Hato's pout. He also dubbed her Hurricane Hato. Tagata added helpfully, a nickname Azawa fully agreed with. He suggested I eat the hairs of other heroes to see if I could manifest any level of their quirk. Amajiki gulped nervously as Azawa stilled, picturing the terrifying thought, you're to share the notion with your mentor hero and nobody else. He stared the three in the eye, this has to be kept secret till we know, and likely even after. That kind of power would likely draw plenty of unsavory attention or panic if it got out. Understand. Sir. The three nodded to him, accepting his declaration. Back to the report though, what do you three think of him? Azawa got prepared to write notes. I see why you were concerned. Tagata gave a whistling Hato the side eye when a certain someone asked if starving himself or going without water would make it so he didn't need to eat or drink anymore, he genuinely considered it. No hesitation, no shock or horror at the idea, just unrestrained curiosity. Thankfully, I got him to promise to never do that without the approval and observation of a medical professional like Recovery Girl. Urge to kill a balloon at rising. But the most important thing is his self-esteem. Amajiki gulped as Azawa turned to look at him, but the nervous boy continued, he said that the water hose heroes were the first people to ever believe in him about his dream to be a hero, that he met them less than a year ago. And that boy is determined to enter this line of work. Azawa knew full well what it felt like to have people telling you for years that your aspiration to be a hero was a fool's errand, to give up. Yep. Very much so. Do Italy. The teenagers all nodded at his assessment. Thank you. Azawa nodded, rubbing his temples, keep up the training sessions with him and let me know if anything else shows up. I have another meeting to get to so head on to your homeroom. Seeing the students out he locked up and made his way to the elevator, wondering why on earth Nezu and All Might wanted to see him. All Might. Pacing back and forth in Nezu's office, All Might waited for Azawa to arrive, everyone else he'd entrusted with the secret of one for all. 
Hearing the elevator ding, All Might put on his public speaking face, Hello Azawa. How bad is the news and how badly will it make me want to punch you in the throat? Azawa stared blankly at them, slowly reaching for the man's comfort sleeping bag. Ignoring Gran Torino's cackling, All Might cleared his throat to begin, it's a secret about my quirk. Everyone in this room was already read in onto it, but we've deemed it necessary to read you in as well. My quirk wasn't originally mine, nor did it originally belong to the person I gained it from. This quirk dates back to the first generation of quirk users and has had eight users, including myself. And so, the explanation continued, going over how his quirk worked and just who had created it. You're looking for a successor. As Awa deduced, already aware of his time limit, I'm guessing the candidates are among the students, so you wish for my opinion as an instructor. Well, not just that. All Might gave a nervous grin, as Awa having always been able to unnerve him, I've been doing thinking recently, including the necessity of a singular pillar standing in the limelight. A powerful force fighting for good from the shadow might. No. Azawa held his arms up in an X gesture I refuse. Not happening. Forget it. But why? All Might pouted at the sudden hard refusal. I barely get enough sleep as it is with the stress of looking after my rampant problem children during the day and doing my underground hero patrols at night. Give me that and I'd never be able to get a moment's rest ever again. Azawa retreated to the yellow sleeping bag of safety as he gave his speech. Ignoring Nezu joining Gran Torino and cackling, All Might sighed, not giving up on the idea of Azawa getting it eventually, or at least an underground hero, he continued regardless, your opinion as an educator and a splendid hero would be greatly appreciated. I have a list of current candidates. Handing them over to Azawa All Might saw the man barely skim through the list, before Azawa's capture scarf was attempting to strangle the life out of him, Azawa giving a red-eyed glare, well lonely night I bothered trying to save him from the enraged teacher. What the hell are you thinking with some of these you moron? Need air to answer? All Might wheezed pitifully. Shoto Todoroki. Packing up his bag, Shoto prepared to go to the option after school lecture offered by Sir Night Eye on the intricacies of detective hero work. Most of his class seemed eager to do the same, Kirishima, Yuraka, and Ashido having said they were heading to collect Midoriya to bring him to the event as well. The hell's going on here? Hearing the small purple pervert shouting from the door, Shoto found himself looking up despite himself, noticing a large crowd gathered outside their classroom, those gathered all wearing first-year pins on their uniforms from the Gen Ed courses and Hero Class 1B. Most of us here had to come and get a look at the famed Class 1A, an exhausted-looking purple-haired Gen Ed student Shoto would swear is related to his always smirked, especially when there's talk about one of you being likely to get the boot. There's blood in the water now, and those who want to get into the hero course are ready to send out a declaration of war. Ignoring Mineta's pathetic whimpering and preparing to offer the Gen Ed boy all the best luck in replacing the scum, something Hagakur seemed ready to do as well, Shoto was cut off by a cruel and arrogant laugh, you're focusing on the wrong class Nikwal. An Ashen blonde boy stepped forward, holding a hand palm up in a clawed gesture, small acrid pops and explosions filling the palm class 1B, my class, are the threats to keep an eye out on. These extras barely managed to get past some two-bit thugs. Not surprised that any class with that useless green fuck Deku would be full of trash. The thug looked into the classroom and sneered, I see Deku ain't here, that loser finally realize he'll never be a hero and give up on his stupid goal, to be a the bastard's words were cut off by a rush of eyes. Everyone else in the hall rapidly scrambling back away from the frozen prison binding the ash blonde to the wall. It was only as he stalked forward that Shoto registered he'd made that ice, felt his quirk practically leaking off of him, as he stalked towards the shaking with rage bastard whose hands were inkist in ice completely, which seemed to restrain his quirk. At least for now, you came here to piss us off. Shoto glared coldly, congratulations, you've succeeded. I'll enjoy breaking you in the sports festival. Our classmate's name is Izuku Midoriya, it wasn't hard to figure out who Bakugo meant by Deku, given the mentions of green and not present, insult him again, and you'll face the consequences. Behind him, he could hear the various crack knuckles from other members of Class 1A, who had grown proactive of the relentless grey giant. Glancing at the window just over this thug's shoulder, Shoto froze as he saw that where his hair had been before was now part of his quirk. One side had a mane of ice, the other billowing flame. Steam rose from the new hairdo, and a pair of horns jutted up from his head like an oni, one for each of his elements. His shock allowed the ice and fire to fall apart as Shoto shook himself, you can get yourself out. And turned to go, he could get the lecture notes later, figuring out what had happened with his quirk was more important. And? Yes, I do have an explanation and reason for what Shoto's quirk did besides aesthetic. That'll get shown next chapter. Chapter 19. And? Hey everybody. Poll finished and the winner was Mirko. 
however Momo was neck and neck the entire time and was only two votes or so behind at the end. I'd thought of a good idea for each that way I'd be set no matter who won, but now I'd feel sad if one got dropped, which is why both are being posted in this cycle. Also, this is going to be the last update for a couple weeks. My computer is dying a painful death, this is actually being posted from a borrowed computer. I've ordered a new one, but it hasn't gotten in yet. I'll get back to writing once it comes in. AN2. To those wondering why Bakugo hasn't gotten all warning like Mineta has all he's shown is a bad attitude in front of the teachers. They don't have any actual proof of his actions outside class or before UA. Chapter 19. Endeavor. Frowning softly, Endeavor flipped through the newspaper, his reading glasses in place as he saw all the articles about crime statistics. The USJ attack had made waves, not only emboldening villains all over the country, but with so many street-level criminals and thugs taken off said streets in the aftermath, the areas they controlled now lay unprosected, causing a power vacuum in the criminal underbelly. Making note of where the worst cases seemed to be, according to the day's paper at any rate, Endeavor started planning out more strict patrols to bolster security for the civilians. In their own chairs in the living room, Fayumi nervously worked on a paper of some kind, possibly a thesis for her courses, while Natsuo just texted grumpily, sending the occasional unhappy look Endeavor's way, seeming to think that it went unnoticed. Hearing the door open with a loud impact, Endeavor shot to his feet, flame beard igniting, while Fayumi and Natsuo looked wide-eyed only for Shoto to run into the sitting room, mind the door Shoto. Fayumi scolded with a sigh now that it was clear it wasn't a Balsi burglar. What is going on with my quirk? Shoto ignored his sister, staring Endeavor dead in the eye, why does it keep doing this? With a small pinched expression of concentration, Shoto's hair became a long mane, one half ice and one half fire, a pair of oni-like horns rising from his forehead. Natsuo dropped his phone in shock, while Fayumi let out a startled squeak at her youngest brother's new hairstyle. It would seem you've already developed your first vent. Endeavor nodded unfazed, I'd wondered if your ice would be reflected once you developed one, assuming you even did. What on earth is a vent? Shoto narrowed his eyes as Endeavor rolled his own, taking off his reading glasses with an exasperated sigh. It would seem you failed to listen when I explained this before. Do you just ignore everything I state about flames and their uses? The silence was telling as Endeavor let out another sigh, a vent is an aspect of flame quirks that achieve a certain level of power. It's pushing a portion of your energy out in a singular stable method that can be maintained to take up energy and let you bleed off excess power. Given the USJ and the training you've been doing since I'm unsurprised you've already developed one, you were always meant to be stronger than me. But why does it look like that? Fayumi frowned as she eyed the now identified vent atop Shoto's head. Vents are shaped by the intent of the quirk user when they first manifest. Endeavor's expression soured somewhat, I'd say you were angry and trying to intimidate someone, so your quirk manifested something you associate as ominous. If you wish to change it, you should focus on forcing the vent into whatever shape you do want and do it fast or you'll be stuck with that. His bear flickered mockingly, that's why I'm stuck with this stupid thing. All three of his children blinked in bewilderment at his statement, wait you know how ridiculous the firebeard looks. Natsuo forgot his own vitriol for a moment out of sheer bafflement. Despite what many would assume or imply I'm no fool Natsuo. I'm well aware now how stupid it looks, but when it manifested I was a teenage boy, unable to grow facial hair, and I wished to look like my older brother who I remember had a rather impressive full beard. Natsuo's snickering was only cut off by his sister cuffing him upside the head. Azawa. Sending glares at the still cowering All Might huddled in the corner, Azawa removed several files from his stack of candidates. I'm dividing these into three categories. Currently viable, not without some work, and why the hell are they here you fucking moron. Language. Recovery girl scolds, but doesn't protest the concept of the designations. Let's start with the hard no options. As always slapped down a stack of folders, Bakugo, Monoma, Tokoyami, and Midoriya. Their quirks all might began only to go silent when Azawa gave him a hard look and a raised hand for quiet. Bakugo is rude, brash, and hyper-aggressive. He already has a superiority complex and is someone that we think to have been a physically abusive bully, even if we have no evidence. Giving him that kind of power would let it go to his head. Plus he sweats nitroglycerin, we don't need his explosions any bigger than he can already make them honestly. I can already feel the amount of explosion insurance policies growing once he makes his sports festival debut. Fair. The others in the room allowed with an awkward wince. Though Koyami is because his quirk is already volatile and sentient. Just being in a dark room has him struggling to control his quirk from going on a bloody rampage at times so supercharging that isn't a risk I'm willing to consider. Azawa ticked off another candidate, while Midoriya and Monoma have some different reasons they do share an important one. 
Midori already has problems controlling his temper, I wouldn't want a major increase in his power till he gets a better grasp of his emotions. Monoma has a superiority complex much like Bakugo. However my concern is how the government would respond if either got the quirk. They're worried they'd be weaponized. Nezu's tone was dark, although given the principal's history with being a literal lab rat, it was understandable. You said this quirk, this one for all enhances both the user and their original power. As Awa tapped the two students' files insistently, think about what that could potentially do to these two. Monoma could copy a quirk that was stronger than the original, or permanently keep the quirks he copies, if not both. If Midoriya has it then I could see his resistances developing rapidly while paired with All Might's strength. Who knows if he could even truly die at that point. That kind of offensive and defensive combination would have the government wanting to use him as a weapon of war against other nations, labeling him a villain if he refuses. Other nations would be desperate to try and poach him or send women to seduce children out of him, something he'd be at risk of already. No, there would be too big of a target with Midoriya getting it. I hadn't considered that. All Might admits sheepishly before giving a million watt smile, only further proof that I was right in wanting to bring you into our confidence. Moving on. As Awa ignored All Might, hiding his amusement at the giant man sulking, those who would only be possible after getting some work. We have Shinso, Iida, Todoroki, and Kaminari. Thankfully for you, most of them seem to have at least started on that. Aminari is working on improving not only his control, but sharpening his mind ever since the USJ, the incident having served as a wake-up call. Todoroki has his own hang-ups, but I've noticed him seeming more relaxed than he even was before the USJ, so I hope he's getting over the hang-ups he has with his both sides of his quirk. Iida is too quick to judge something and too inflexible, although he's seemed lost in thought at all times since the USJ, so he's hopefully considering those factors for himself. As for Shinso yes, his heart is in the right place for wanting to be a hero, and one for all could work well with his quirk, assuming the general public didn't become terrified of him, but at the moment he has no drive or work ethic. He never really tried in the entrance exam, resigning himself to failure when he saw he was fighting robots, rather than trying to find a workaround. Even Mineta managed to muster up the motivation to take the machines on. So, keep an eye on them and offer some nudges in the right direction when needed. Grant Reno nodded, and the rest. And finally there's those currently viable. Azawa nodded to Gata, Heido, Kirishima, Kendo, Kamakiri, Shoda, Tetsutetsu, Sunatori, Yanagi, and Shiazaki. All show some level of viability on the factor of quirks, and apart from Kamakiri being a bit of a competitive fighter, I don't see much issue. Any top picks? Night I leaned in, clearly hoping to hear something specific. A few stand out above others. Azawa admitted to Gata and Heido are excellent heroes, but they're close to graduation time they'd have as students where they could dedicate to mastering this upgrade would be limited. Plus it would be harder to explain given they're already decently well established. From the fist years Kirishima and Tetsutetsu are both good candidates with similar defensive and offensive abilities. Yanagi had a good quirk to upgrade in a way that wouldn't be connected to All Might's, to help hide the true nature of your quirk, Shota would have a terrifying level of compatibility with the power, and admittedly Kamakiri would be a good choice. Granted, I'd say Kamakiri would need to calm down the competitiveness, but his pure physical combat style would match with yours all might. Well, at least we're better off than we were before. Detective Tsukauchi groaned as he got up well, I leave you all to confer, I need to get back to the precinct. Small time crime and villains have been on the rise since the USJ, but let me know if any more progress is made. And? No Izuku this time, but as I said, computer situation is limited. Next chapter is very much Izuku-centric though. Chapter 20. Izuku. Anting, Izuku ran through the labyrinthine obstacle course his tutors had somehow convinced Cementus to set up. Not only were the big three hunting him in this place, but they'd brought along their friend Yayuhaya, who was eagerly joining in the torturous training session. He couldn't even stay in his more durable form, as the labyrinth changed sizes as he changed areas, and while he fit some places, others were too narrow, so he had to switch back. 1, 2 I'm coming for you. Hato's voice echoed through the cement labyrinth, somehow both eerie and adorable three, four better hit the floor. Not even bothering to question it, and knowing that Hato tended to give clues away from her overdramatic sense of presentation, he just barely dodged the wall blasting in, her shockwave going where his head had been. Five, six were full of tricks. The voice of Hayu whispered in his ear as Izuku hastily scrambled to avoid her latest attack, still feeling the spirit gun attack singe him as he escaped the girls and rounded the corner, only to run face first into Amajiki. 7, 8 I'm, just the bait. The nervous boy said with a shaky smile as Izuku paused for a moment confused, realization hitting him just as Tagata's fist uppercut him from the floor. 9, 10, we'll be sure to do this again. 
Tagada happily declared as the cement walls finally lowered, the four third years approaching to help him up. Was the song really necessary? Izuku Salt giving them an annoyed look as the third years, apart from the still timid Amajiki, nodded smugly. Draining should be fun. Hato declared happily. How was that fun? Izuku resisted the urge to face palm at the Blunet's antics. It was fun for us. Haya smirked, high-fiving the gyre who bounced around happily, likely just having too much energy to properly contain. That's just called Hado. Izuku grumbled while the bubbly girl pouted. Ooh, just call me Najira already. She flailed like a grumpy kitten, it's so much cuter than my last name. And you can call me Mirio if you want. The taller blonde offered with a grin, Haya and Amajiki not extending similar offers. I'd say just call him Tintin. Haya snickered, most of our class does it. You're a mean little sidekick Yayu. Mirio pouted at his friend who blew a raspberry at him. I'm gonna be Najira's sidekick, that means I can keep sassing you as much as I like. Haya sounded quite smug about her logic too. Wait, who's Midoriya gonna be the sidekick of then? Mirio tilted his head curiously. Obviously he's gonna become the sidekick to that Yanagi girl. Najira rolled her eyes like it was common knowledge, they're just so cute together. Izuku felt himself blushing as Najira gushed about him and Yanagi being the cutest firsty couple ever, even if they weren't actually dating, a fact she happily ignored every time it was brought up. Hearing the door to the training facility open, he saw Azawa enter looking eerily somber. Midoriya we need to talk. The four third years all shared a glance, clearly surprised by the tone as well as Azawa led him aside, a glance showed Izuku's friends waiting for him outside the building. Is something wrong sensei? Izuku felt his nerves rising even as he tried to squash them down, this probably wasn't anything serious. Maybe his teacher just got told he'd have to take a long car ride with present Mick or something. If this is about the whole sports festival thing where I have to give a speech as student rep don't worry, I've been working on what to say. Having to talk in front of people admittedly still sounded terrifying though. Midoriya Azawa sighed, looking more tired than Izuku could ever remember seeing him before, there's no easy way to say this. There was an incident earlier today. A serial killer going by the name Muscular went on rampage with his quirk and was confronted by the water hose heroes. Hey I'm sorry. Izuku felt like his legs were about to give out as memories flashed through his head. Seeing them show up to save him from the sludge villain. Their encouragement as they took him to a proper quirk specialist and set him on the path for proper training. Sending them an email, telling them about how he got into UA. Getting a reply, a promise that they'd be watching his performance in the sports festival and would be happy to have him do his internship with them, maybe even his eventual work study. But now, they're gone. His voice shook and he didn't bother to stop the tears he felt fall from his eyes, his teeth clenching as a surge of anger rocketed through his body. He wanted to find this muscular, he wanted to break him, where's the one who killed them? Izuku's tone was dark and ominous. Escape to lick his wounds. Azawa shook his head, not bothering to hide what would likely become public knowledge, they managed to destroy one of his eyes and badly injure him, so he'll be underground for at least a while to recover. I I know what it's like to lose someone important to you Midoriya, someone who inspired you. Azawa placed a hand on Izuku's shoulder comfortingly, part of why I push you kids so hard is to do my best to make sure you're ready for this world we live in. The try and ensure talks like this don't have to happen. I won't tell you to not want to stop their killer, I'd be a hypocrite if I did. I just want you to promise me two things. W what things? Izuku felt his stammer return for a moment, confusion at his teacher's words overriding his blood boiling rage, even if only for a moment. First, you don't run off and try to be a vigilante about this. Azawa looked him in the eye, don't throw away your life or your future for revenge. Train hard, be determined to stop him if you ever meet him, but don't run off and fight him now. And then the second. Izuku hated how much logic there was in his sensei's words, but he knew damn well that if that monster had been able to kill heroes as amazing as the water hose duo, then he'd likely tear Izuku apart. Become a hero they could be proud of. All for one. There we go. The good doctor finished his work, removing his gloves as he finished Tamura's latest examination, the bullet holes are healing up quite nicely. The scarring won't go away, but you shouldn't lose any of your mobility, so long as you do the exercises I instructed you to. Tamura scowled at that as he got off of the doctor's table, griping his cane with a murderous expression, I'll make them pay. Tamura's voice was raspy as he used the hand not clutching at the cane to scratch his neck all of them. Those damned heroes, those fucking brats, everyone. They'll all pay. Yes, I'm sure you will young Tamura. All for one nodded to his embodiment of destruction, the villain in training still showing the wild desperation he'd had ever since he was a child, but how do you intend to do that? Tamura looked at him in confusion as if that was a trick question, eyes flitting over to a tank with a nomu inside. 
Now, now, you can't rely on my power and resources alone if you wish to grow tomorrow. All for one chided the UA Sports Festival is coming up soon. So, in that spirit of education I have a bit of homework for you. Watch the sports festival. Study the students from the class your attack failed with. Write up an intended plan for each and every one of them, and then come back to tell them to me. Yes master. Tamura scowled irritably at being denied new toys and having homework assigned before Kurajiri warped the boy away. He's far from ready. A new voice pipped in, four screens lowering down, each one allowing the four other acolytes he trained to speak to him, too brash, and not having the power or skill as of yet to back up his boasts or ambitions. He lacks a goal, lacks direction. The oldest of his acolytes spoke up thoughtfully, his screen confirming he was still in America, more than that he lacks a personal rival to truly push him. Someone that he wishes to overcome for his own reasons rather than just that they're your enemy. Perhaps that teacher who survived the attack, Eraser had right. The third acolyte asked from his current location of Egypt, having been down there to recruit a new ally for his own goals. I wish to capture him for my own experiments actually. The fourth and youngest acolyte apart from young Tamura spoke up, my goals are making steady progress, but he would certainly be a valuable resource. Do you wish for me to return to provide a boss? The last acolyte, currently in Germany, asked, I could get my crew together and be back in Japan in a couple days. No. He shook his head, he still needs to learn. And I have a couple other resources I can call upon if need be to assist him. Tamura is not ready to learn of you all, not yet. Continue running your budding empires and contact me should there be any complications. Dismissed. But the wave of his hand, the calls ended and the four went back to their various duties and plans. Think Tamura will be smart enough to use the sports festival to try and scope out All Might's successor. The good doctor asked, having kept silent while he spoke to his disciples. One can only hope. All Might. I've done more thinking on the matter of candidates, and I've narrowed down the list further. All Might stated to Nezu, Gran Torino, and Sir Nidai, the four of them being the only ones meeting that day. To start with, I've decided to remove Miss Hado from the running, as well I'm sure she'll be a splendid hero, I feel she lacks the necessary he paused to search for the right word attention span, to use the power safely. Fair. Nezu nodded with a shudder, likely thinking what his strength would do with someone as chaotically energetic as Najire Hado. From the first years I'd say the top picks would be Itsuka Kendo, Ijiro Kirishima, Ryaiko Yanagi, and Nirinjeki Shoda. All Might cleared the table of all but the five dossiers. I would like to bring young Midoriya into our confidence eventually though, once Azawa feels it's a good time. The boy's quirk would make him an excellent sparring partner for my successor, while they learn to properly control their newfound strength. Not to mention should the worst come to pass and all for one returns, or a successor of his vile empire, and a new symbol is needed, he'd be on hand. Hope for the best, prepare for the worst. Gran Torino nodded. I have no issue with bringing the Midoriya boy into our fold eventually. Sir Knight I nodded, I spoke with him after my lecture, and he showed a truly impressive intellect. Mirio speaks highly of him as well. What of your four first-year candidates? Gran Torino looked at their files curiously. Young Kendo and Kirishima are already physically fit enough to receive the power right now if I so chose. All Might nodded, happy to explain his reasoning, Kendo is an excellent heroine with a good temperament from all I've heard. And while her quirk itself is simple, it would pair well with the enhanced physical abilities of one for all, which I can train her more on. You couldn't teach a fish to swim brat. I'd end up being the one to train her. Gran Torino chided, swinging a cane at All Might's head. It was only due to years of recovery girl doing the same that he was able to dodge it honestly. Yes well. All Might coughed next is young Kirishima. His hardening ability should help him withstand the strain of one for all the most of the various candidates. His quirk runs on stamina, so the boost to his physical abilities would truly be a blessing there. Shoda and Yanagi however are not physically ready to receive your quirk. Nezu noted, the small mammal sipping some tea. Not even close. All Might shook his head, but I think their quirks would likely pair the best with one for all from those that remain. Shoda's quirk already lets him do a second impact that will always be several times stronger than the first. Using his quirk with even a fraction of one for all's potential would be able to make his output far exceed my own. His noted tactical abilities would also be a benefit. Those were something he himself had only gained through the school of hard knocks. And Miss Yanagi. Sir Knight I asked, flipping through the more detailed dossiers now that they had a narrower selection. Her telekinesis currently only lifts what's roughly the weight of a human being. All Might grinned, but with the potential of one for all, it could evolve to be comparable to the strength the quirk gives me. It would also be distinctly different from my own abilities and style to help hide the true nature of the sacred torch. Well with the sports festival coming up, I'd say the best bet we have right now is to test these students. 
Nezu gave a eerie chuckle, let's see what they're capable of. Azawa. So, how'd it go? Kansas asked him as he entered the staff lounge, a hot cup of coffee waiting. He didn't take well. Azawa took the drink gratefully, I hate having to tell a student their mentor is dead. Especially if they're just a first year. The look of anguish and denial never got easier to stomach. They were good people. Kansas rumbled, raising his own coffee in a silent toast to the fallen heroes. I made sure to bring Midoriya's friends along so they could make sure he got home safely. Azawa copied the gesture, after this though I'm going to be a bit selective on any potential internships he goes to though, want to be sure that whoever mentors him won't make the situation worse. The tension between our classes isn't helping things either. Kansas winced, with how riled up they all are, I wouldn't be surprised if some of them went deliberately looking for more than they could chew to try and one up the other class. Draining his coffee and refilling it, Kansas looked at him, I was actually thinking of a new training exercise to implement after the internships. Two on two combat matches, but each partnership is made from a student of each class. Force them to get along and work together. Given we already have three students each that are actually part of a friend group together they'd make good first choices, show the rest that getting along won't cause cats and dogs to start falling from the sky. I'll think about it. As Awa promised right now right now I just want to go home and fucking sleep. Izuku. Sitting at his desk, Izuku stared at the photo of him standing with his mom and the water hose heroes, the married couple, having even signed the picture after it was taken. Knowing that they were gone now, that all he had was memories, it hurt. Picking up a piece of paper, Izuku started reading over the speech he'd been preparing for the sports festival. He'd been watching videos online about all the speeches past student representatives had given, speeches from various pro heroes, and even political ones. It was bright, it was cheerful, it meant absolutely nothing. Angrily tearing apart the speech, Izuku slammed open a new notebook, writing down thoughts as they came to him. He could always edit it later to flow, but for now he had to make a real speech. Something that was uniquely him, that embraced identifying who he was trying to be like the sports festival was meant for. The hero they'd be proud of had been his teacher's words. I will be. End chapter.